proceed and also if you wish to uh, sign up for public comment <coughs> uh, Ms. Salazar is grabbing the <coughs> sign-up sheets but if you haven't had an opportunity please do so or we'll certainly call from the group so with that will the clerk please read um, item 4 item 4 resolution 2023-1 appointing the mayor pro tem of the city council of the city of Lakewood. Okay, so every year uh, we choose a mayor pro tem and I'd like to just take a moment to thank uh, Mayor Pro Tem Vincent for her year of service. Um, really appreciate all that you've put into. There's a lot that goes into the role, not only here on the dais, but out in the community and you've done an incredible job, certainly a challenging year in some ways. So thank you very much. And Councillor Abel, you are up. Thank you, Mayor. It is my uh, extreme honor to nominate Wendy Strom to be our next mayor pro tem. Uh, I believe that Ms. Strom, Councillor Strom is a, uh, a uh, role model, a non-divisive member of council. That's fairly rare. And uh, I'm proud to uh, put her name in nomination. Thank you. A second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any discussion on this? Okay, seeing none, please cast your votes. Oh, oh. Councilor Springsteen. Oh, I just wanted to express, uh, as I did to Councilor Strom earlier today, my uh, support for this nomination. Um, I think that she is a classy member of our council. I did ask her um, to, um, I, I believe that she's somebody who could restore some of the dignity that we should have in the mayoral seat um, and have lacked. And so I asked her if she would um, sort of speak up in that situation, but I appreciate um, that her being willing to do this. Thanks. All right, thank you. Point of order, Mayor. Yes, sir. I believe that uh, we're supposed to open the floor for other nominations, including self nominations for Mayor Pro Tem. So certainly we do have a motion and a second. So if you want to pull that back and I can ask for more. Well, I think all the nominations come under the same umbrella. So if there are any further nominations, this is the correct time to make them. Correct, but there's, a, there's certainly a motion I on the floor. Okay. So we would just have to pull that out to see if there's any other folks who would like to well, be nominated or nominate. I will pull it. Pull second. 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 Mary. Excuse me. Second. Okay. Are there any other nominations? Okay. If you'd please redo your nomination. I renew my nomination. I renew my second. All right. It's a motion and a second. Please cast your votes. Yeah. All right. On this. Okay. I'm going to hold that off for a second before I show the votes. There was somebody who signed up to speak on this item. Ms. Cheney, did you want to speak on this or was this for something further down the agenda? No? Okay. All right. Well, with that, congratulations. 11 eyes, zero nays. Look forward to serving with you this year. Next up is public comment. This is the point in the meeting where the public is invited to address the city council on items that did not appear on the agenda. 
All comments should be directed to the City Council. I ask that all persons either in attendance or calling in observe the same decorum um, of the City Council Chambers. I mentioned the call-in number, but I'll certainly reread that again. If you're engaged, 720-707-2699, webinar ID 849-5732-0840. You'll press pound twice. And to raise your hand, you can press star nine and star six if you're joining us online. Um, and if you're online, you'll have three minutes. When you're at two minutes, 30 seconds, you'll hear a, and then you'll hear that again when your time is up. And I'll ask you to wrap up as well as in chambers. You should have a clock here and it'll turn yellow at two minutes, 30 seconds and red at three minutes. And again, I'll politely ask to wrap you up. So again, this is general public comment. Ms. Herskovitz, you are up. And I'll also note that we had six comments on line ranging from a couple comments about complete neighborhoods to snow plowing. First of all, congratulations, Mayor Pro Tem. Should I begin? Please. Last week, there was an article in the Denver Post that discussed an order filed by senior U.S. District Court Judge John Cain in which he granted a preliminary injunction preventing Denver Public Schools from enforcing an extensive ban on an individual who is a critic of the school system. He's accused of repeated abusive bullying, threatening and intimidating conduct directed at district employees. The judge found that the speech used by the critic did not endanger the safety or the security of any DPS employees and that as public servants, they cannot be insulated from criticism related to their employment. The judge did not feel the critic had acted uncivilly or unprofessionally. Now you might be wondering what does this have to do with Lakewood? In light of the December 19th special meeting regarding aspect of the city manager's contract, I found one part of Judge Kane's ruling very applicable. He stated that civility and professionalism have been used as tools of discrimination and to silence opposition. Civility is synonymous with decorum, a favorite word used by Mayor Paul to justify muting, interrupting or talking over counselors who don't accept the status quo. These counselors are not behaving inappropriately. They're merely asking questions clarifying content or stating facts. If December 19th was an isolated event, it could be overlooked, but it is not. When the mayor mutes a counselor and says he'll circle back later, he, dis he disrupts the continuity of thought, which is detrimental to both the speaker and the listener. To make matters worse, the majority of council members sit back quietly and never confront the mayor for his actions or defend the councilor being muted. There is the glaring hypocrisy of one council member who on several occasions has spoken up in defense of the Iranian protesters who are fighting for women's rights and freedom of, of expression, yet has shown no support for fellow councilors who are silenced. In a recent interview, this same individual referred to these council members as disruptors. You are a body made up of individuals who have diverse thoughts and policies. You must work together to best represent your constituents. Lakewood likes to present itself as an inclusive community that welcomes diversity. That should also apply to ideas. Thank you. Great, thank you. So next up, I might mess up the last name, Peter. Yeah, that's all right, welcome. And then next up after that, I have Scott. Sorry, kind of tall here. All right, thank you. Uh, just begin any time? Yep. Okay, thank you. All right, my name is Peter Zawistowski and I am here with my wife Katie and my son because we are concerned about the recent bridge closures by Green Mountain Water and Sanitation District, which I will refer to as GMW, in Lakewood Parks Ravine's open space. 
We have been homeowners and residents of the Green Mountain neighborhood for over 10 years. Katie grew up in the neighborhood and attended Divinity Elementary, as does our son today. We love our neighborhood then and now. There are three bridges within Lakewood Parks Ravine's open space. This open space backs directly to Jefferson County Public Schools, Divinity Elementary, and Dunstan Middle School. These bridges have historically served a dual purpose. One, as wastewater conveyance piping, and two, as pedestrian bridges within the open space to, to traverse the uniquely steep terrain. GMW has recently posted signs on all three bridges stating that, that pedestrians, pedestrian use of the bridges is considered trespassing. We respectfully request that as representatives, uh, re representatives of our city and community, you reconsider your efforts to work with GMW to prevent the closure of pedestrian bridge use um, for the following reasons. These bridges are highly trafficked, trafficked by the community as a means to commute to school and for recreation. During the school year, families use them to safely commute to school. When schools are not in session, the bridges still are still used by families to gain access to, to playground at Divinity um, Elementary and track and fields at Dunstan Middle School for extracurricular activities. Without the bridge, um, bridge, walking would be impractical as the alternative to cross the ravine without the bridge is unsafe. Walking around the ravine would mean double, the, doubling the distance to school. Driving children to school is, is an option, but the ability to walk a safe and scenic 10 minute path to school should be preserved. We all would agree that a walkable community have both tangible and intangible benefits to all who live in the area. The ravine is very steep with large drop-offs, so hiking, biking in the area without these bridges is unsafe and would damage the slopes. When the bridges are closed, recreational options in the area will be greatly dim diminished. It is obvious and clear, as shown by the extensive trail network visible by public satellite images, that these bridges have been utilized by pedestrians for decades. This can be attested by many community members, homeowners, some even original, that have lived in the area for 30 plus years in our neighborhood built circa 1960, 1970. <clears throat> Any argument that these bridges were never meant to serve as pedestrian use is without merit or is without the best interest of the community. If not originally intended for pedestrian use, why are all three bridges open to trails on both sides and contain pedestrian railings? Further so, the northernmost bridge has a sidewalk leading directly to it, presumably owned by the city of Lakewood. Surely the use of these bridges for pedestrian traffic for over 50 years must serve as precedent. Barricading will be an eyesore to the, to the beautiful open space as well. We are asking our community leaders to work together for the best interest of the community and to come up with a solution with GMW to maintain this critical bridge infrastructure. Walkable com um, communities are important. Open space access is important. Please assure us that we can maintain the walkability and open space access we've had for 50, for 50 years for future genera generations like our son to utilize and enjoy. Thank you. Great, thank you. Scott? And I have Katie? All right. Welcome. Good evening. Uh, my name is Scott Stefani. I'm also a resident of Green Mountain neighborhood. I just want to show my support for Peter, um, along with just to make sure, make sure everybody up here understands that um, there are dozens of families that have the same interest in that open space. So I'll make it short and sweet. Cool. All right, thanks. Thank you. Katie, then I have uh, Nicholas Kane after Katie. Welcome. So I'm Katie Zawistowski. I think that Peter said it all very well already, but I just wanted to be up here to say that we're here to support him and that our community is really concerned about this. So that's why we're bringing it before you tonight. Cool. Thank you. Thanks. For folks that normally don't come, I will get through public comment and I can circle back. Mr. Kane, come on down. Then I have uh, Joan Poston, then Linda Stapp. Good evening. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and council members. Uh, last time I was here on uh, November 28th, I brought to your attention some problems we were having in the neighborhood uh, surrounding uh, Florida Avenue and J Street, Kendall, uh, Ingalls, with regard to water pipe replacement and some irregularities that we were encountering in the neighborhood there. Uh, I must commend the city council and the mayor's office and the uh, city attorney for uh, 
jumping right on the problem. We got the response from the contractor pretty quickly. I was hoping I could come back here today and, and give you all kudos, but unfortunately there's a problem that has arisen. I'll go over that real briefly. I think I can summarize it in a couple minutes. Um, on December 5th, Colorado Civil Infrastructures Incorporated distributor flyers to the neighborhood indicating that the water would be shut off from 8 a.m. to 3 p.m. And in order to connect to the new water service. This is something we were all anticipating with, waiting with bated breath because it had been six months since they started tearing up the street and replacing the pipes and everything. Um, that evening, the water was back on, and we thought after nearly a year of disruptions, our lives would return to normal. I was writing a speech about how I was going to come back to the next council meeting and thank everybody for helping expedite the uh, uh, repairs and everything. However, two weeks later, on December 21st, uh, I called the contractor to remove debris and pylons and some tractors that were still parked on uh, the 6100 block of West Iowa. Uh, they were removed within 24 hours. However, on December 23rd, a, a gentleman who I'll describe as a whistleblower uh, within the contractor's office called me on the telephone to say that uh, the water had never been switched over. So none of us in the neighborhood were advised that despite placing notices on the doors that the water was going to be switched over, it never took place. They just quietly removed their equipment and never came back. However, the whistleblower called me. I do have his name and everything if, if it's needed later on. Uh, I verified his veracity uh, to the best of my ability. He stated that um, the water was never switched over. The contractor was a, unable to get lab samples uh, that would pass. Uh, by that, he uh, explained that asbestos water pipes under Florida Avenue are contaminated with bacteria. Uh, if they have to replace the line with PVC piping to get rid of the contamination, it will take up to two years. I want to make sure the city of Lakewood is aware of this development. Uh, he admitted that six known cases of residents contracting bacterial infections from the tap water are known to the contractor. Uh, a seven-week job has gone well over six months and is $750,000 over budget as far as the contractor is concerned. Uh, the whistleblower further stated Denver Water provides water to all surrounding suburbs, including Lakewood. Uh, and he, the, the whistleblower, would not drink from the tap water based on what he has seen floating around dead in the reservoir. So uh, that was an eye-opener for me. Uh, I think the citizens of Lakewood need to be informed if the water is safe to, to drink, to cook with, to bathe in. Uh, and I would just request that in the future, uh, uh, a low bidder is fine. I understand how that works. Government contracts are usually awarded to the low bidder. But I would just ask that the low bidder be their background and their performance uh, be checked to make sure that you're not going to run into more problems uh, than the job itself. Uh, and uh, that's all I really have. I just want to bring all that to your attention. And if anybody has any questions for me, I'm, I'm happy to provide them. But like I said, this could be the whole infrastructure for metropolitan Denver is deteriorating, falling apart. Our neighborhood is just a micro, microcosm of everything going on around the metro area. So you may also be victims of this type of water contamination in the future. And Council Person Stewart was kind enough to help me. And she got back to me in a timely manner, and I appreciate it. Great. All right. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yep. Thank you. Okay. Uh, hello, my name is Joan Poston, and I've been here several times, and I'm back again. It's a ringing the gong one more time. So, <clears throat> what has happened with the land at 4th and Union? I'm not sure. I don't think it's titled yet. The sign that says it's for sale is still up. I have talked to several people, and you know that I have had a FOIA and the FOIA was supposed to be returned to me on 1-5. They are delinquent. I have written um, a couple of congressmen, and we are still working on this situation. But while I was working with this, um, I did call the Public Health Department. They do have this new department. The department is called the Department of Health Equity. And I've been trying to explain to them how it's not equitable 
to put small children in um, affordable housing on alleged contaminated land. And that time he said to me, well, there is another little problem and it has to do with the 15 acres that we know is contaminated because the um, EPA has put a restriction on this piece of property. And the EPA, it was covered over with cement. It's been capped. I don't know if you've heard of this. And um, with the capping of it, um, they have said that there can be no digging on this piece of property. None. So somebody came up with this brilliant idea that for this piece of property, we should make it a park. And I started thinking, who could make this a park? And there were two entities that I came up with. The open space, Jefferson County, and Lakewood, the park systems here. So last Thursday, I did go to the um, uh, open spaces um, advisory committee meeting, and I talked to them about how my advice to the advisory committee was if anybody came to you and said, let's make this a park, that they say no. So I don't know what's going on with it. I don't know the background. All I know is this gentleman at the public health department told me this, and I was shocked. And um, so here's my piece of advice to you all. Someone comes to you and wants to give you a piece of property, 15 acres from the 4th and Union, say no. Thank you. Linda, Robert, then Carrie. Hi, everyone. Thank Hi, you so good much. evening. It's still going. But anyway, my name is Linda Stop, and I will start it over. Ward 4. First, I would like to thank all of you for your support and careful consideration of plans and policies that make our city more sustainable and regenerative. As you know, Lakewood is part of a network of human communities across the globe that are interdependent. There's only one blue planet for all. Both citizens and government officials must be excellent stewards of its bounties. The impact that our city makes to foster this global interdependence is essential and vitally important. The time is now to make a difference. To that end, our citizen group, Clean Energy Lakewood, an offshoot from the Sustainable Neighborhood Network is here to ask you to rapidly increase the actions we take in Lakewood by updating and revitalizing, then strategically utilizing the Lakewood Sustainability Plan. Specifically, we ask that a Chief Sustainability Officer position be created and funded with the staff needed to make meeting our current and future goals possible. The new position will champion sustainability innovation and implement new technologies to meet the specific needs of our city. Secondly, we ask that you strengthen communication about our sustainability plans, goals, and priorities with citizens and businesses to increase awareness and action. We must make citizen participation a priority. Our, our city should hold educational forums to review current climate change impacts and gather citizen input. These forums can assist the new chief sustainability officer and staff in implementation of projects and policies. In addition, the new Chief Sustainability Officer position will make possible an increase in outreach to young people to garner their creativity in addressing climate change and in engaging Lakewood's citizens in positive outcomes. Finally, I ask you to consider linking emergency preparedness and climate change mitigation 
to our sustainability and regenerative efforts, emphasizing prevention and regeneration rather than return to the status quo. The deleterious effects of climate change have a greater impact on how income, on, on low income people, seniors, and other vulnerable populations. Equity, resilience, and social change can be emphasized in our city by our example. Can you wrap up your comments? Our please? example in the everyday living and thriving in our amazing Lakewood. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Robert Carey, then Jana. Good evening. Thank you. I had um, <clears throat> um, handouts there for, for you. My notes here are fairly extensive, but I won't go through them in detail. Um, Robert Youngberg, uh, Ward 4. I moved here in uh, 1991. And um, my son went through Green Mountain High School and uh, Lakewood Junior High. Uh, I have about 40 years uh, overall experience in energy conservation and renewable energy, starting back as 1978. Been a while. Um, I'm retired. Uh, part of that, I have the privilege of uh, volunteering a lot of different places. Right now, I'm uh, uh, serving on the board of directors of the International Solar Energy Society, their headquarters in Germany. And I recently had the privilege of attending the uh, United Nations Conference of Parties in Egypt for the COP27 uh, to represent them. And one of the takeaways there that's highlighted on the, on the handout is that uh, it's taken 45 years, but the solar PV um, is now uh, contributing a new, new uh, uh, energy con uh, power, new construction, is over 50%, over 50% of new electrical generation capacity is solar. 25% is wind. So you have 75% total of a new generation. Uh, typically, energy is divided, uh, when they look at it, as far as consumption is power, which is electrical power, transportation, industry, and buildings. And uh, I have, uh, my background is in uh, um, buildings, so I'll, I'll be talking about that. Um, you're all fam uh, familiar, <laughs> at least you've, I know you've heard of the um, Investment Reduction Act of, of 2022. Uh, over $300 billion. Uh, obviously, there's a huge amount of money there available for citizens of, of, of Lakewood and also the city of Lakewood to, to use to uh, address those issues. I've heard reports that might be as high as tens of millions of dollars for the city of Lakewood. I don't have, I'm sure your staff is all over that as far as different opportunities. But I want to talk about three things in, uh, for Lakewood to invest in energy conservation, invest in renewable energy, and of course, invest in the future of Lakewood. Uh, the easiest thing for energy to reserve is not to use it in the first place, you know, conservation. Um, I'll talk just real quickly about my own home. I uh, bought a house uh, here about eight years ago, another house, <laughs> um, and it's about eight, 28 years old, and of course it needs a lot of work. Uh, attic insulation, ventilation, uh, doors, windows, etc., water heater. Uh, major improvements needed. Um, so I contracted with the Energy Conservation Company. I also installed a solar system. And between the two, I got a little report here from Excel that's on page two, is that I am using 91% less energy than my efficient neighbors and 95% less energy than, than all my neighbors. And that is, and this, that is not an extreme amount of, of, of uh, money investment there. So on, this, on the third page, on the well, next page in December, 100% um, uh, in December for solar. And here are some numbers here on the third page as far as what, what, um, um, what it could, uh, what kind of energy conservation um, and, and energy investment could be made. So thank you for uh, taking the time. I've got some references there. And I'd be more than happy to uh, talk with any of you individually at any time. Thank you. Great. Thank you. So I have Carrie, Jana, and Tom. Carrie, you're going to bring down your little friend, which not very often we get. Not very often we get a little furry guy down at public comment. I was, I was trying to keep her <laughs> under wraps, though. Okay. Um, <laughs> good evening, Mayor and Councilors. Thanks for the opportunity to speak. Um, I'm Carrie Sonneborn. I'm a longtime Ward One resident and a participant in the Sustainable Neighborhoods Program. Uh, and I want to talk today about um, 
few different things. Recycling, in particular, is and how it's a basic element of the circular economy. And despite its green reputation, Colorado isn't very good at it. As a state, Colorado kept just 16% of its waste out of landfills in 2021. The national average is 32%. So not real impressive there. But the Colorado Producer Responsibility Program for Recycling is going to require companies that sell products in packaging, paper, and food service pro type products to fund a statewide recycling program starting June 1st, 2023. So this is a great opportunity to take a leading role in recycling for the city of Lakewood. Specifically, the city can require commercial haulers operating within the city limits to institute pay as you throw. The more trash you put out, the more you pay and inclusion of recycling services in standard trash collection. Um, another way to decrease trash is by composting. However, apartment dwellers and non-gardeners need other options. Um, you may be aware that the city of Edgewater has partnered with a local company called Scraps, which picks up compost from people's homes for a fee. Um, I'd like to suggest that Lakewood could collaborate with Edgewater and Scraps and maybe bring the, the there is a fee attached to that, but it may, perhaps by collaborating we could bring the fee down more, and I think it's very worth investigating. I'd like to mention the benefits of urban trees. They reduce the cost of doing all kinds of other work, including stormwater management, air purification, slope stabilization, reducing heat islands, and water retention. And they even can advance environmental and social justice as they provide human health benefits, biodiversity, bird, and pollinator habitat. Uh, trees encourage people to be outdoors and exercising so they contribute to healthy lifestyles. And tree ben trees benefit mental health, helping to reduce crime and improve property values. I have a reference for that if you want to see. <laughs> Thus, the city should focus its tree planting in lower income areas because urban trees are already concentrated in wealthier neighborhoods. And I do want to thank the city for including a budget for trees in, um, in, its, um, in its budget. And I urge you to continue with that and, and increase it for 2024. Lastly, I want to mention soil enrichment. Conventionally, conventional monoculture lawns that need watering, mowing, pesticides, fertilizers, raking, and bagging leaves in plastic and then throwing them in the trash is a huge waste. It literally poisons the land and throws away soil nutrients while killing insect pollinators, many of which overwinter in, in leaf litter. So I'd like to propose that the city have a campaign, an information campaign about wildscapes that you, using native plants. Uh, and to, to wind it all up, the complexity of all these issues suggests that a chief sustainability officer is essential and that this should be being debated by the city council. Thanks for all you're doing and that I know you will do in Great. 2023. Thank you. Thank you. Jenna, Tom, and then Elizabeth. Good evening, Mayor, City Council members. Hi, my name is Jana Six. I'm a resident of Ward 1 for the last 17 years. Um, and I'm a co-founder of the Alliance for Sustainable Colorado, which was founded 19 years ago. So in that role, I have had the chance to work statewide and even nationally on sustainability issues, bringing people together to talk about, well, what are the sustainability issues? What does that mean? And what's a priority? And how do you get it done? And after speaking to hundreds, probably thousands of people in the roundtable meetings that we would hold together, the one common denominator that kept coming up is that sustainability means different things to everyone, but it always includes thinking about the environment, the local economy, and equity for people. And you've probably heard of the triple bottom line, but that's what I'm going to ask you to consider tonight. You need to have somebody on staff who is looking at every decision you make and considering how does this affect our local economy, the people that have to pay the bills? How does this affect our local environment? And how does this affect the equity, the people with the most disadvantagement? Um, 
I know you have to make a lot of important decisions, so using this sustainability lens will make a big difference. And this is not something you can implement department by department, but it's transcending all departments. A sustainability director is a person who can come in as a systems thinker and look at all the facets from all the departments and see how they can be meld together. I see tonight on your agenda you have a budget approval for a day labor program. That's a financial decision, but what about the equity and the environmental part of that? So a sustainability director is the person who advises every single department on how you can be more sustainable in whatever decision you're making. So I would appreciate your consideration of this in the future. I'm speaking to you now the first time I've ever been to this city council office because we can't continue business as usual. Um, we need to make some urgent changes in the way we're behaving. And I've seen other cities moving forward, but I'm not seeing Lakewood move forward quickly enough. And I thought through osmosis living here it would happen, but I know I need to speak up. So thanks for this opportunity. Right. Thank you. Tom, Elizabeth, and Ron. Uh, thank you, Mayor Paul and City Council. Seems like a million years since I've been here. Uh, maybe it has been, I don't know. Anyway, um, I'm here this evening uh, in support of Clean en Energy Lakewood to talk about sustainability. And I'm briefly gonna talk about where we've been, where we are now, and uh, where we can go in the future. So, Councilor, or Mayor Paul, sorry. Probably is the only one who remembers that our sustainability journey started at the 2009 planning retreat, uh, where we first reached an informal consensus to prioritize sustainability in our community. Uh, with the first step being promotion or uh, appointment of a sustainability coordinator. Uh, we moved forward from there. Uh, a year later, we had a sustainability coordinator. Then we moved forward to establishment of sustainability division, uh, and then to a commencement of a planning process for sustainability that began in 2013, culminating in 2015 in the adoption of a plan by city council. That's where we began. So where we are now is our sustainability division has really grown remarkably. Uh, we have four employees uh, who are very dedicated. What they lack is the funding for programs to be able to adequately implement the goals and policies of the sustainability plan. And so, but uh, they put their best efforts into it all the time. Major accomplishments over the past few years, the expansion of the Sustainable Neighborhoods Program, growing Earth Day into a major community celebration uh, and educational event. And of course, most recently, promulgation of the Sustainable Development Standards. So that's, uh, that's where we are now. So where can we go in the future? Uh, we've witnessed in the past uh, several years the devastating consequences of climate disruption, most notably the Marshall Fire in 2021. Uh, however, there is hope, but we all have to move together uh, to, to create a better future. And so there's really three things, and I'm standing behind Clean Energy on uh, Lakewood on this. Uh, the first one is that we need to increase the stature of the sustainability manager to uh, uh, chief sustainability officer or some such language. Uh, and the goal is to allow them to effectively coordinate sustainability efforts across the city. Um, secondly, to update or look towards updating the sustainability plan and um, integrating it better with our city comprehensive plan. And finally, um, increasing the, the appropriation of funding for programs in the sustainability division as well as for staffing. So I know that council has a lot on its plate. Um, there's a lot to consider as you go into your planning retreat in a few weeks. Um, I wish you the best. Sustainability is certainly a very high priority for, for our group, but I know you have a lot on your plate. A quick thank you again for your consideration on a different issue, and that is the distressed properties issue. So with that, I wish you all a good evening. Thank you very much for your time and your commitment to the city. Thank you, single subject rule. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thanks, Tom. Good evening, Ron, Amy, and Laron. Hi. Good evening, Mayor Paul and members of the City Council. I'm Dr. Elizabeth Molinar, and I'm a resident of Ward 1. I'm a professor of anthropology and sociology and do research on the social cultural impacts of energy production and energy consumption. 
I'm an active member of the Sustainable Neighborhood Network in Sustainable Iber, and I am also um, active with Clean Energy Lakewood. I come to address council at least once a year to ask you to make sustainability a priority for your city council retreat um, or for, for the list that you generate during the retreat. And this year, I want to emphasize considerable action. While our sustainability division is always performing at the highest level, the division itself needs to be elevated. Compared to other cities of a similar size, for instance, Fort Collins here in Colorado, our division has less human power and a smaller budget. While these few folks in our city every year do fantastic work, it is almost an impossible task to keep up with what present reality demands of us. For instance, if we take into consideration climate change related adverse weather events, energy markets and water security, we need to do more. We're not meeting the goals of our own sustainability plan and the Jefferson County Climate Action Plan, the State Department Environmental Justice Plan and the goals from the Paris Accord, to name a few, are more ambitious than the level that we're performing at and require that we get more serious. A couple of examples or highlights. The city needs a sustainability plan upgrade like Tom just mentioned. Um, also, I wanted to say that we should treat sustainability and equity as related or interrelated and review all policy plans in terms of sustainability and equity like we do for financial feasibility. Uh, and that should not be like a separate thing but integrated like Jenna mentioned. Some other strides to make, the city still needs a slash and composting facility. It has been over a decade and this has not been materialized. Slash composting is an important part of waste diversion which helps conserving energy, reducing the burden on landfills and other waste disposal methods like Carrie also indicated. It's not merely a convenience, but it's um, treated as such sometimes. And we need more solar solar energy. The sustainability division has been working on a solar garden for years. I'm familiar with the challenges of making this happen and I can only imagine if we had more budget what the trajectory would look like. Lakewood has so much potential and can be a leader among cities in the U.S. but currently we are a step behind. Places that are doing well on sustainability have something in common. They don't see it as a partisan issue and consider it as urgent and spend money on it. Uh, our youth is ex experiencing major climate anxiety, so let's roll up our sleeves and make some change for that current reality. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Ron, Amy, and Laurent. And then anybody else who has not signed up in chambers, please come down and see Jay. And if you're online, go ahead and raise your hand. Hi. Hi. Greetings, Mayor Paul and Councilors. I live in Ward 5, so I'm happy to meet my representatives here. <laughs> Uh, I, hope, I look forward to getting to know you better and discussing the issues with you. Uh, tonight I'm going to share some thoughts on the sustainability issue. I'm on the Clean, energy, or Clean Liquid Energy Committee. And I want to talk about the economic benefits of doing sustainability. And I'm going to mention six ways that that happens. But before I get into those six, I want to thank you all for the progress we've already made in Lakewood. Everyone on the Clean Energy Lakewood Committee has the best interests of Lakewood at heart. We want to work with the city staff and we, together we can do a lot more. So the first thing that I want to mention, uh, uh, one of the six ways that energy efficiency, renewable energy sustainability will stimulate the local economy is to retain energy dollars in the city. These, every dollar that we spend in Lakewood for electricity and gas leaves our local economy. In the, in the residential sector of Lakewood alone, 2021 records show that $87,840,000 left the community of Lakewood for the purchase of electricity and gas, just the residential sector. That does not include commercial, industrial, and, and other parts of the, the, the city. Reducing that drain by just a small amount would have a huge impact on our local economy. Studies also show that when you save dollars in the community, they roll over up to seven times before leaving. It's called the multiplier effect. You've probably all heard of those. Um, local residents in Lakewood are putting a lot of money into the pockets of XL shareholders and in the pockets of 
uh, company executives. The third one is that energy efficiency, renewable energy, and sustainability programs create jobs. We can never have too many jobs. In fact, it shows that investing in solar photovoltaic energy creates an average of 1.5 times as many jobs as investing in the same amount of money in fossil fuels. Ecosystem restoration creates 3.7 times as many jobs as oil and gas production per dollar. Building efficiency retrofits create 2 times 8, 2.8 times as many jobs as fossil fuels. Mass transit creates 1.4 times as many jobs as road construction per dollar. Those are some examples. Number four, the energy efficiency, renewable energy, and sustainability programs increase tax revenue within the city of Lakewood. Number five, energy efficiency, renewable energy, and sustainability programs can take advantage of all of the present Inflation Reduction Act funds and energy efficiency. These programs create community spirit and pride. And lastly, it increases volunteering in the community. So I want to thank you for the, the opportunity to give my comments in this city council meeting. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Amy? Then we're out. Anybody else in chambers? Okay. So if anybody wishes, as we wind up in chambers, anybody online, go ahead and raise your hand, star nine, to request to speak. Welcome. Mayor Paul and City Council members, thank you for the opportunity to speak. My name is Amy Allen, and I live in Ward 3. I work at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, but I'm here tonight as an individual and a member of Clean Energy Lakewood. As the other speakers have noted, Colorado is already experiencing serious consequences of climate change, including through more frequent wildfires and prolonged drought. Here in the Front Range, we suffer ozone pollution that's now considered in severe non-attainment of the federal standard to which oil and gas extraction and CO are prime contributors. Beneficial electrification or electrification of fossil fuel combustion driven processes is a significant step that will be required in order to curb carbon emissions to make a significant impact and fighting climate change. Here in Lakewood, an empowered chief sustainability officer could help advance these goals by distributing incentives, leveraging utility, state, and federal funds, and implementing ambitious energy performance standards in new and existing city buildings. Heat pump technology, both air and ground source, has improved greatly in recent years making all electric space heating feasible and efficient in climates like Colorado's. A 2018 analysis by the Southwest Energy Efficiency Project concluded that in typical residential new construction, an air source heat pump serving a home with the Denver area's electricity supply would reduce carbon emissions by 30% relative to a gas furnace. Developers such as Diverge Homes are building all electric single family homes in the front range that are already less expensive than comparable homes with natural gas appliances after accounting for incentives from Excel Energy. An analysis by the Rocky Mountain Institute in 2018 found that in many locations in the US, all electric appliances resulted in lower lifetime costs than natural gas appliances in residential new construction. Recent geopolitical events further underscore the benefits of being insulated from volatility in fossil fuel prices. This table shows available rebates for home electrification retrofits available from the City of Denver and Boulder County. The City of Lakewood can and should join these other cities in Colorado and be a leader on beneficial electrification starting with creating a position of CSO and empowering him or her with a meaningful budget and staff. 
Rebate programs such as these in other communities also help by leveraging additional state, federal, and utility dollars, as other speakers have mentioned. Thank you for your consideration, and uh, please um, continue your sustainability efforts with the creation of a Chief Sustainability Officer. Thank you. Good evening, dear Council and Mayor. I'm uh, Lauren Mayo in uh, Ward 1 and uh, Clean Energy Lakewood member and I'm here to wrap up our presentation tonight. Um, so we've touched on seven big domains of needed sustainability action. Community solar programs, energy efficiency, beneficial electrification, retrofits, and rebates for, for those. Two, the tree canopy, composting, biomass recycling, soil enrichment, stormwater runoff avoidance. Three, bike lanes, multimodal transportation, and electric vehicles. And we were happy to see other people talking about pedestrian access tonight. Um, four, muni buildings to 100% renewable energy and higher energy efficiencies with long-term savings. Five, fully focused grant writers to capture unprecedented state and federal funds and opportunity for clean energy and recycling. Six, upgrading building codes, including sustainability codes and implementing Amendment 13. Uh, seven, benchmarking commercial buildings and developing future carrots and sticks to transform that sector. Uh, and we see to make real progress on each of these topics requires one to three people to implement plus external contractors. So we're asking you to please act by a broad majority uh, vote at your council retreat uh, on three items. One, create a CSO position, Chief Sustainability Officer, empowered to act across the whole city. The fact that sustainability affects all departments is no reason at all to refuse a CSO. This is a major cause of our failure to implement our city plan. Uh, money affects all departments. No one doubts the need for a CFO. Uh, information technology affects all departments. Nobody with a reasonable mind would say that's an argument to remove the chief, <laughs> the chief ITO. Uh, Boulder, Fort Collins, Denver all have a CSO. So let's get real on this. City management will select the exact person but cannot refuse the strategic importance of this position and role. So after years of requests, it is clear you need to demand it as our community's elected officials. Um, two, double our sustainability department staff from four to eight next year and structure towards 12 within a few years. Communities of similar size with similar plans like Fort Collins and Boulder have each 36 sustainability FTEs with at least a dozen inside the sustainability department. And three, last but not least, fund a few millions of dollars towards sustainability for energy and water retrofit incentives and for implementation of programs. This builds on what you passed with Amendment 13 and these community investments combine unbeatable economic multipliers and benefits with deep environmental health and equity benefits on the side. You ran to make a difference. You are well seated this year. Uh, the climate and resource emergency is real. The federal help is here. And we believe there is an unprecedented council majority supporting sustainability action. Your annual strategic retreat is just around the corner. This is your moment, your legacy. Let's do it this year. Thank you. Right. Anybody else in chambers? Okay. Nobody online. I'll close public comment. And certainly thank our folks that came out and our young man here to join us enjoying some local government. So thanks for taking time out of your Monday night. And I walked those bridges to school as well when I went to Dunstan. So we certainly understand, and I think we've seen quite a bit of correspondence to council and uh, encouraging our friends at Green Mountain Water to engage uh, further. Hopefully we can find a, a resolution moving forward. So thank you for coming out to 
to discuss that. Mr. Kane will certainly continue to engage. I don't think that's a Lakewood water system, which certainly any sort of contamination is bothersome to the community as a whole, but I would imagine there's also a district board uh, that should be accountable, but we'll certainly engage. Ms. Hudson? Um, I believe it's Alameda Water and Sand okay. and our public works director is online listening to that conversation. So he or um, someone from his staff will follow up. Great. And thank you for that. Sure. Absolutely. And there was a, just a comment about the Federal Center, and I know Ms. Poston left, but certainly those 59 acres have been of great conversation, and it goes back to the time when St. Anthony Hospital was built and was built on a similar brownfield that was remediated. 59 acres, there is a parcel that is capped. The federal government owns the land currently and did go to auction. There was a high bidder, and I think they're in a due diligence phase. And we don't have it on our website anymore because it just hasn't been in front of us for some time, but there is a CDPHE report on, uh, there's a full environmental on the property that I think if you Google it, you can find. Is that accurate? Okay. And once again, thanks for our Clean Energy Lakewood folks. We always appreciate when you come out and uh, engage with us. So, Mayor Paul, can yes. I add just one more thing? Um, we will continue to work with Green Mountain Water and Sand to try to find a, a good solution for all of these kiddos and the park users who are trying to um, get across from the residents over to the schools as well as over to the park. Um, so I've talked to our community resources director today and although we have been in conversations to that end, we're going to continue to see if we can find a good solution. So thank you. Cool. Thank you. All right. Well, we are moving along to the consent agenda. The use of the consent agenda has been made to expedite council action. It contains both resolutions and first reading ordinances. Resolutions are items of routine nature. Members of the public will have an opportunity in a moment to comment on any of the proposed resolutions. First reading ordinances appear on the agenda for the purpose of setting future public hearing dates and ordering newspaper publication of the proposed ordinance. No public comments will be heard this evening on first reading ordinances. The public will have an opportunity to comment on the proposed ordinances. During the scheduled public hearings on the date set tonight by City Council, any member may request an item on the consent agenda be removed for separate discussion and action under general business. Will the clerk please read the consent agenda into the record? The consent agenda includes items 7 through 14. Item 7, Resolution 2023-2, approving City Council appointments to various boards and committees. Item 8, Resolution 2023-3, designating the public place for posting notices of public meetings during 2023 pursuant to CRS 24-6-402. Item 9, Resolution 2023-4, reappointing and appointing members to the Lakewood Advisory Commission. Item 10, Ordinance 0-2023-1, amending Title III of the Lakewood Municipal Code to establish an exemption from the city's sales and use tax for certain retail delivery fees enacted by the state of Colorado. Item 11, Ordinance 0-2023-2, amending Title III of the Lakewood Municipal Code to establish an exemption from the city's sales and use tax for the carry-out bag fee enacted by the State of Colorado. Item 12, Ordinance 0-2023-3, amending Title V of the Lakewood Municipal Code to enact a one-year moratorium on the annual adjustment of the city business and occupation tax rate. Item 13, approving minutes of the city council meetings, City Council regular meeting November 28, 2022. City Council regular meeting December 12, 2022. Item 14, accepting minutes of the boards and commissions. LAC full committee October 9, 19, 2022. Board of Appeals on November 8, 2022. Thank you. I'll now open the public uh, comment portion for the resolutions, which are items 7, 8, and 9. Nobody has signed up. Anybody wish to speak on any of those resolutions? I will note that um, item 9, resolution 2023-4, is reappointing uh, and appointing members to the LAC, and I'll turn that over to the screening committee chair. Councilor Franks. 
Thanks, Mayor Paul. Um, well, I first wanted to start my comments out tonight to thank uh, Mr. Rob, our city clerk, and Ms. Tate for all the support. Um, certainly, uh, there is a lot of uh, excitement about being on those committees and commissions, and we've also been talking about how to make it more efficient, and we recently just had presentations, and we can just see the quality of the work that the commission uh, produces, and I just wanted to thank staff for all of the efforts. And tonight, Council, we are recommending as a body, uh, uh, the screening committee, a reappointment of Karen Morgan uh, to the LAC and appointment of Neil uh, Priester, Laura Rapp, Alice Shelley, and Marcia Wynn. Thanks. All right. Well, if any of you are here, thank you. And if you're watching or tuning in, we appreciate, we appreciate you signing up. So I'm going to turn to our previous mayor pro tem because we're just going to keep with that for the motions this evening and I'll ask for a motion on the consent agenda please my last official act <laughs> mayor Paul I move for the approval of the city council minutes the acceptance of the minutes of the boards and commissions and order all ordinances introduced on first reading to be published in the Denver Post with public hearing set for the date included in the ordinance and for adoption of resolutions all of which are included in the consent agenda items introduced into the record by the city clerk Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any discussion on the consent agenda? Okay, seeing none, please. Oh, one clerical error, forgive me. There was a note, and we'll just note this in the record. Um, the CML main representative uh, will be chosen when the legislative committee picks their chair. So it does have somebody listed, but that'll potentially change. So with that, please cast your votes. Councillor Stewart, thank you. Councillor Springsteen. I had had my hand raised. I was just trying to comment on the appointments. Um, okay, go ahead. I, I My comment was just going to be that you know, for the fourth year in a row, I had made a certain request uh, about appointments and that did not occur. So I'm gonna vote no. Okay. Can somebody push no, please? Oh, down this way, okay. All right, that passes 10 ayes, one nay, the nay being Councilor Springsteen, thank you. Springsteen, your hand's still up. All right. Uh, will the clerk please read item 15? Public hearing, item 15, ordinance O-2022-25, authorizing unbudgeted expenditure of grant funds in excess of $75,000 from Community First Foundation for Lakewood Day Works pilot program. Okay. I'll open the public hearing. I will note that there was a presentation, and there was not a presentation on Lakewood Speaks, but we have folks here to answer any questions. Nobody has signed up to speak. There was a letter in support submitted um, by the West Colfax bid. Seeing no comments, we'll close public comment, and I'll ask for a motion. Mayor Paul, I move for the adoption of Ordinance 0 20 22 25 on second and final reading. Sorry. Second. Okay, motion is second. Are there any comments? Councillor Jansen. Well, thank you. Um, again, we are um, having a Colorado Constitution problem to me. Um, so for history's sake, we're going against the Colorado Constitution Article 11, Section 1 and 2 again. And even though I think this is a really interesting program, I just think there might be a different way that we could go about it. Um, I have a couple questions. Why wouldn't the community first set up a direct grant to Bayod? 
Um, my second one, uh, will this process allow for competitive bidding, which I highly encourage? And what is the employment specialist? Well, actually, um, Ben, uh, ben already get, let me know about this one. So I already figured that one out. So um, I have those two questions for you. Great. And Ms. McKinney-Brown, I, I don't know in a second, maybe we could address the constitutionality question if, if you're available. I'll just set the table real quick on, on how a little bit of this came to be as a goal of this city council was to deal with our homeless and our homeless response. Mm -hmm. And other communities have had uh, successful partnerships uh, with Bayot and other entities uh, in, in Denver, Aurora, Boulder, different communities have engaged in this. And when this opportunity came to light and the West Colfax Community Association did a really small pilot program, um, I had had a conversation and reached out to Ms. Hodson and basically she said, see if you can go find some money and reached out to Community First and they were thrilled to have the opportunity to grant this enormous amount of money to see if a difference could be made on West Colfax employing uh, folks in the corridor and, and hopefully not only beginning with that piece of dignity with the employment but uh, employment specialists, professionals and, and really allowing uh, another entity who specializes in this to run it rather than the City of Lakewood setting up a whole program. So Community First was gracious enough to grant that, and I also would say that the county stepped in, also realizing, and so this is a triad of Community First, the City of Lakewood, and the county. And with that, Ms. Dietnicker, did you want to answer any of those other questions? Um, I think you covered uh, a good percentage of that. Um, I would just add that uh, Community First Foundation, um, as the mayor explained, um, wanted to provide this opportunity to Lakewood and, and have, the, um, have the ability to identify the areas and locations that we uh, within Lakewood know um, are areas that could benefit from this type of a program, um, doing a lot of different community service and cleanup events. Um, so it was an opportunity for the city to identify those locations that we all know um, could certainly use a little bit extra help. So, so the 29000 is coming from the city? Correct. Okay. To pay Bayod? Correct. Okay. Uh, Community First Foundation is approximately, actually I have it written right here. $270,000. Um, $227,829. That's the whole program? That is the grant funds That's from the, the Community funds. First Foundation. We have another 29,000 that is City of Lakewood funding and then another 29,000 um, from Jefferson County. So I, I don't understand. So why, why does the city need to fund this? Why can't you just fund it yourself? So she is with the city, forgive me. Oh, so she's, apologies. Yeah. I should have introduced myself. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. I understand now. <laughs> okay. Thank you. And I just, just with the constitutionality problem, I just, I'm, I'm having, I'm having problems with that. And that's just kind of where I really think it is a really good program. I think it really is. But just making sure that if, if we can do it without, with the constitution, um, I just, I, I can't, I can't pass, I can't vote for something unless it can pass constitution. Thanks. So the Colorado Oops. Supreme Court has uh, interpreted Section 2, Article 11 of the Colorado Constitution, providing that um, cities, municipalities, have the right to support public purposes. And you'll notice that during COVID, one of the things a lot of cities did was they found ways to transfer grants to private businesses to keep people afloat during the pandemic. And the Colorado Supreme Court had said that was fine. This is the same thing. This isn't about supporting the business. This is about supporting people in Lakewood who are in need. So it's a public purpose. It's not supporting the private business. And and as long as there is, it meets the public need, the Colorado Supreme Court has said that it is in alignment with the Constitution. And we do have representatives from Bayot here, um, just for counsel, and they are a nonprofit as well. 
Councillor Vincent. Okay. I just um, want to express my thanks to Bayot. You did a wonderful job and the support that you're giving to the community that really needs it. Um, this was the number one complaint I got, frankly, was about um, the trash, et cetera. The, we had somebody in here talking about equity and environmental, and that's exactly the thing that people were so upset about. Um, and I think, too, the addition that we can give the homeless and those people who uh, need a helping hand, a helping up, um, that that's wonderful. And I can tell you that businesses have been extremely grateful on the Colfax Corridor, and also probably from 16th to 14th, I think, also. Um, so I thank you. And um, it's made a heck of a difference all around, both both for our people in need and for the businesses and the people who walk up and down Colfax. Thank you. Ms. Hodson. Thank you. I was just going to introduce Amy Dieknicker. Um, so she's been with the city for a long time, but she's recently been promoted. And she is, we think her position is housing <laughs> services supervisor. Is that right, Amy? Housing and uh, neighborhood support supervisor <laughs> kind of close <laughs> and so she is our expert in the city on dealing with um, um, folks who are less advantaged for the city so she manages our CDBG fund she works extensively with our unhoused population with our neighborhood support team and on and on so um, congratulations to Amy while I have a moment thank you nicely done any other questions or comments? Okay, I just want to make a comment because I think this is a big deal and, and we've seen the emails that have come in about um, concerns along our corridors and we're also really examining our response to our unhoused population. Uh, I think on a large level and now we're starting to drill down as we've had lessons learned which we might talk about in council reports. But uh, I just want to thank Bayad and truly am so excited that uh, Community First has stepped up with just a phone call and an ask and their willingness to jump in and really fund the bulk of this and, and also our, our county commissioners in the county. Um, this is a one-year pilot, um, gives dignity to people. It allows folks to have breakfast and lunch and to work in our community, have job training, gain their IDs. Um, and really hopefully put people on a path to sufficiency. And I think that's um, something that we have lacked a little bit in the community. And Ms. Hodson, thank you for um, your willingness to, to have these conversations. And I'm super excited to support this and see it move forward. And I wanna thank Amy and everybody who's worked to see if this would be a fit for Lakewood. And I think it could be up to 50 individuals, potentially three times a week working in our community. So it's a, it's a fantastic, it's a fantastic value, especially to our community citizens. So with that, I'd ask for your votes. And that passes 11 eyes. So very cool. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Clerk, please read item 16. Public hearing item 16, ordinance 0-2022-26. Oh, an emergency ordinance authorizing the conveyance of a permanent utility easement to public service company of Colorado to realign primary power lines serving the city's quail maintenance facility located at 1050 and 1060 Quail Street and 850 and 870 Parfait Street by and through an emergency ordinance for the immediate preservation of the public peace health or safety okay <laughs> thank you for that so those folks that can't see on tv or online we did have um, some water spilled so we'll do a little dance while we're recollecting ourselves there is a public hearing so i will open the public hearing nobody has indicated a desire to speak on this item i will note that this is an emergency ordinance that accurate yes so that will require a super majority and um, anybody online wish to speak dance, dance. okay seeing nobody online 
We'll close public comment. And wait for a quick second. There was a We're good? We're good. All right. <laughs> So we have closed the public hearing on this item. Uh, I'll ask for a motion, then we'll go to comments and questions. Okay. Mayor Paul, I move for the adoption of Ordinance O 2022-26 on second and final reading. Second. Okay, there is a motion and a second. Councillor Jansen. Or maybe it was pushed when, when, when we were cleaning up water. It's all right. No, I turned it off when I called on you. Yep. Okay. So are there any questions or comments? All right. Seeing up, oh, Councilor Matt Guerrero. Okay. Motion a second, please cast your votes. Passes 11 eyes, zero nays. Thank you. Clerk, please read item 17. Item 17, presentation on draft code changes from Ad Hoc Campaign Finance Committee. All right, and I think we'll go ahead and keep it with you, Mr. Rob, Thank, to kick yeah. us off. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of council. Um, just as a lead in, you all have a hard copy of the committee's um, red line changes to chapter 2.54. And the, that copy reflects the committee's work during their five meetings during 2022. There's a bullet list in the staff report to council that summarizes the committee's uh, amendments to chapter 2.54. And I will read those into the record and then defer to council, councilor Abel to elaborate on some of those topics. The draft red line of chapter 2.54 does the following. Inserts gender neutral language changes language from person to person and or group, includes a definition of the term group and amends the definition of person and also electioneering, allows campaign expenditures for child or adult dependent care when a candidate is actively campaigning, raises the small donor contribution to $100, prohibits public monies from being expended by Lakewood, by Lake, excuse me, Lakewood staff or current office holders of any campaigns, prohibit, prohibits unexpended campaign contributions from being donated to another candidate or committee, reduces the civil penalties for prohibit, prohibited contributions to any committee, dismisses a complaint if a decision is not rendered within 15 days after a hearing, amends the reporting deadlines and enforce, enforcement by the city clerk's office, and lastly, requires the city clerk to provide an email notice after a report is three days late and limits any fines to three days uh, if timely notice is not sent by the city clerk's office. And with that, I will defer to the, the chair of the Ad Hoc Campaign Finance Committee. Thank you, Mr. Rob. And I would like to thank you for your patience and all those nights you spent uh, huddled with us trying to keep us on course. Uh, great job. Thank you. Um, there are a number of reasons that we undertook this uh, revision of the campaign finance ordinance. Uh, primarily, our purpose was to establish the word equity again, to establish equity in uh, campaign finance, to encourage everyone, no matter what their resources are, to seek public office. Uh, it is important that we have a broader spectrum of our uh, population setting up here. We've made a couple of inroads lately, uh, but it is not happening quickly enough. Uh, part of the reason for that is that in the last three years, there have been independent expenditure committees 
who have spent $399,000 on Lakewood elections. These are people like the National Association of Realtors, the American Apartment Association, other special interests and gray money at best. Uh, we also needed to address a couple of uh, court rulings. One is uh, the U.S. District Court ruling in the uh, case of the Watchdog versus the City of Lakewood, in which the judge said that uh, we could not classify a media organization, and I would assume that blogs and social media are part of that uh, uh, concept, uh, from advocating for, uh, or not advocating, from reporting facts, reporting uh, a broad range of uh, subjects. So we tried to address that. Uh, and there were also some concerns about uh, the wording in our issue committee uh, language. It was uh, brought up by one of our public commenters, I think is a very good question, and I'll refer these questions to you shortly, uh, Ms. Attorney. Uh, the most of the changes we have made are simply uh, just getting rid of uh, uh, replacing uh, gender uh, specific language for quote person and or group uh, but we spent a lot of time we had are going over these uh, these needs. Also, there have been some concerns that in our ordinance we have wording that says may or shall, uh, or instead of shall, says may and leaves a burden of decision on our city clerk's office. We have removed that and added a uh, percentage fines for uh, electioneering if someone spends $3,000 for a, an electioneering um, communication and fails to put the disclaimer on it. Uh, you know, and, and it goes to a very limited number of people. That's a lot different than some uh, organization spending $70,000 to send out mailers and not have the uh, if they don't have the uh, uh, disclaimer on there. So we, we decided a percentage would be better than leaving it up to the clerk to decide uh, what penalties to assess to someone who may be setting up here uh, one day. Uh, We now have that may and shall option only for a hearing officer so that it is not uh, left to staff to make those kind of decisions. Uh, there is also a question over some recent ruling on a state law. We have the identical phrases in our uh, uh, ordinance that says a, an issue committee must advocate for a purpose or spend $200 or more. And the ruling, I believe, said that you can't have an or there. It has to be a multifaceted test. You must advocate for and spend $200 or more. So I wanted to ask our attorney if our new language in this ordinance resolves the issues uh, raised by the U.S. District Court in the Watchdog v. Lakewood case 
and if we should change the word or under issue committees to uh, advocate and spend. I have to tell you that I have not yet done a legal review on this document, and that's just our standard practice. Staff doesn't tell members of the city council committees what they are and are not allowed to bring to the city council as a whole. So this was what the committee uh, presented, and it sounds reasonable, but uh, I'll go back and do a review after the city council as a whole. Um, decides what they want to do on it. It's just it's just too uncomfortable for a member of staff to tell a, a committee that they can't say something or that kind of thing. Uh, well, that's a concern, but we are not doing this tonight. We're not voting on this tonight. So can you check into those matters or have Mr. Dorchak, who is her uh, attorney in, the, in this rewrite? Absolutely. Everything that you've presented is, is uh, uh, sounds reasonable. The other thing is I really appreciate that you brought to the council as a whole's attention that there are two or three outstanding uh, legal decisions that we really do need to incorporate. So absolutely, we will very much support you in that moving forward. Well, those, those decisions were one of the primary reasons for this revision. Uh, so with all that said, um, I'm willing to answer any questions. Mr. Rob can probably answer them from a uh, more authoritative uh, position. But I'd also like to thank uh, a couple, well, we've had three, only three people attended these meetings, uh, community members, uh, and uh, two of them made very good suggestions. Uh, uh, for this discussion tonight. So um, I'd like to thank them as well and hope that uh, council will move this forward for some uh, legislation and to pull us out of our uh, difficulty with those two court rulings. Okay. All right. And I will note that the RFCA does uh, not have a staff recommendation, but it does mention that it would appreciate a full legal review if council so directs. Also acknowledge that there were six comments on Lakewood Speaks. Uh, I don't have necessarily a public comment portion on this here in live, but since we did have it on Lakewood Speaks, if anybody wishes to speak, I'll do that before we go into anything else. Seeing none, I'll go ahead and close that and go to Councilor Mayat Guerrero. Thank you so much. I really want to start with uh, thanking Councillor Abel for his leadership on this committee. Um, it was definitely uh, a more detail-oriented committee than is, is typically what's asked of us, given that it was like line edits, um, and you really brought us through, I think, in a process that was really thorough and really attentive with great, um, great intentions to make sure that this is a, a fair process. And um, I'll say, too, that I think some of the things that were added are in incredibly important, particularly the addition of allowing for adult or child dependent care to be paid for with campaign funds. We know that um, being a primary care provider or caregiver for somebody can often prevent our ability to take on the task of, of running for city council or other governing bodies, and we want to make sure that all kinds of people are able to run and hold this office. Um, I think that the, uh, I, the only part that I think is probably, I, I just want to draw attention to in terms of, of wrestling with is on that, um, the fine structure. And we talked about this a little bit in the committee and um, I was like, well, this is definitely at least good enough take to, for us to like bring to the full, full body. And so just on the, um, the percentage of cost of communication, which is on page 23 of your paper packet, um, I think that the, so the intention there is really to make sure that if somebody is essentially making a genuine mistake as like potentially a new candidate or a really small localized um, nonprofit um, and they don't have a large overarching budget that the, the fines aren't um, gratuitous. But I also know that one of the things that got brought into the committee space that we didn't quite 
sort out is the fact that digital um, tactics, campaigning tactics, are really, really cheap. So reaching the, you know, like one district of, of 10 to 20,000 um, voters in Lakewood uh, with mail or broadcasts or even a radio ad is going to be, or even a, a newspaper ad is going to be relatively expensive compared to running um, a promoted Facebook post and Instagram post, um, which we know are becoming more and more the like standard fare. And so I would definitely, I think, um, I would encourage us to, to think about maybe if there are sort of bottom lines or to talking about how many people are reached as another indicator or something of that nature because like, I, really, I really think that where the committee got to was we definitely don't want to be essentially ruining somebody's financial health by like making a simple mistake but also recognizing that really being able to have oversight especially as there is increasingly big money in Lakewood elections um, is critically important that we do have the that um, that stick behind us as well. So that's the only that's the only component there that I know I ended up be feeling like I don't know that we quite got there. Um, and but I am in general generally I think that this is a, a great a great improvement with some really important additions and really do want to thank my fellow committee members and our chairperson. Thank you, Councilor Jansen. Thank you. I know I want to commend Charlie, our Council Abel for chairing this and getting us through. And thank you, other members. We, it was a lot of fun, I think. I learned a lot. Um, I, I do have, and I, I think this might be the legal, one of our, um, one of our citizens was concerned of the lawsuits that were being brought to, to Lakewood. And, um, and I, th I think this is what the loss, I, I kind of wanted to give this to Allison. He wrote us a letter and he thinks that we should change some areas with the law. Um, what the judge told us, I don't, and I'm not, I'm not a lawyer, so I don't know. But anyway, I'd like to give this to you. Um, okay, all right, thank you, and that's all I have. But thank you, everybody. Councilor Sharazai. Yes, thank you. Uh, I just want to clarify because I, I think I'm reading this differently than maybe Councilor Abra how you described it. But on page 23. Um, section 2.3b, the change from shall to may, the way that I'm understanding that, that use of that word leaves the discretion up to the city clerk, where before it was sort of a mandate, these are the penalties, you abide by this, these ground rules, um, and the city clerk is going to impose a penalty. But now, this, if I'm reading this correctly, we have um, provided some discretion to a position that really should be non-politicized. And I guess I'm having, I want to make sure that I understood that correctly. Thank you for bringing that to my attention. That is one of the reasons we changed that. I thought we changed those mays to shall instead of the other way around. And I would, yes, and I would, I, I would agree that okay. You know, we don't want to put any burden on our staff to so make the, a decision they're uncomfortable with. It's also in 2.2 .2 above B, so it moves it from a shall to a may, which, again, I think reinforces that point that we've now provided discretion to the city clerk. No offense to Mr. Robb. Right. Um, and we do say in, on page 22, uh, two point, section 2.2A, that a hearing officer may impose, and I think that is a proper uh, leeway for a, a hearing officer to uh, handle. I, so just to add on into this exact topic, because I also recall the same conversation, and I wonder, Mr. Rob, is this the, is this red line like, tracked changes from the original because I feel like we talked about that and I think the language used to say something like shall or may like something really strange and long and we tried to bring it down is that not correct or is that another subject we, we kind of back between shall and may and then I thought we decided that on section on B B was going to be may oh, I'm sorry excuse me so I think on 23B, we were going back and forth, and we went back to May. Thank you. I think the only other place that we changed it was um, 
on 2A was shall. We went back to shall, because I think we changed all the shalls to may except either. that one. Right. Can I jump in there? Yeah. Councilor Oler, go ahead. Thanks. Uh, yeah, all, all these started with shall, and we've changed them to may after a lot of deliberation. <laughs> and, and, and the reason on this one, and it goes back to the, the watchdog uh, case, where, which we lost. No, they lost it too. Any rate, the, um, the watchdog people were fined $5,000, and they had spent something like $4,000 or six thousand I don't know exact numbers. And it seemed like quite a big stick punishment uh, and so they went to court and the judge says, well, it says shell right here and, and I have to, you know, fine you that $5,000. And so then for, therefore they were fined $5,000. So this really comes about from that case. So that we put the May in there early on in our discussions and we put May in a number of places, but then we realized also that puts a burden on the city clerk. But the good thing was the city clerk is our advisor, and he was there at every one of our five meetings. And we discussed this with him about, well, you know, it's going to put it on your shoulders. And, you know, he said, uh, I'll just put on my big boy pants and, and handle it. But I see your point. I mean, it does open the possibility of um, favoritism uh, down the road. Uh, not with our current city clerk, of course, um, but you know later on, um, if if it, it changes or something like that. But you know we can, we went back and forth on this because it's a, a damned if you do and damned if you don't kind of thing. We had an example where it went bad with Shell, and we said, well, let's go with May, and we might come up with an example of where May is bad, but at least. It doesn't, you know, it, it doesn't, um, there's still a stick there. I mean, if, if the city clerk finds that somebody is egregious and just like ignores the law and just goes crazy, they can do something heavy. Um, but if they find that like, oops, I, for and I forgot to put in a little disclaimer. And that's where this whole thing came from, the watchdog thing. They forgot to put a little disclaimer that said, um, doesn't, go ahead. Can I jump in? Yeah. Okay, because we kind of have something. It wasn't the watchdog. It was the mailing. Oh, it was somebody else. Yes. It was the mailing. Right. And that he, they forgot to put right. something on there. You're right. And it's it was 5000 and they and they only had $4,000. Right. And they had to pay the 5000 because the judge said, well, it says Right. But, and what they didn't get in there was this little disclaimer is... Paid for by whatever, whatever. Yeah, something like that. You know, um, it was. It's a minor, minor thing, and and I would add also that our changes and it looks like a lot really are small potatoes in my book. Um, you know, we spent a lot of time talking about the definition of person because it used to be in here that person was defined as. A, a, a native, a natural person, a corporation, a union, I mean, you can, anything you can possibly think of, and there's probably like 10 different things were in the definition, and we changed it to a person is a natural person. Uh, and, and that, you know, that on a red line thing, that creates a lot of changes in it. Um, we're not, we didn't go after the dark money. We, we really didn't even try. And that's why I say p small potatoes. Um, there's been a lot of gray money going through, even in campaigns here, um, and we we can't do anything about it. There are federal laws and state laws that say you cannot um, say where the money can, comes from. I mean, even uh, Citizens United was like, well, you know, it, there's just too many laws made by politicians much higher than us <laughs> that they're they're taking care of themselves, in my view. Um, but we can't really make big laws, and so this is small stuff, really. Um, dotting I's, crossing T's. The big thing is going to be may or shall, and you have a point about the, the conversation we're having right now is the same one we had time after time. And we, we came up with may seems to be the best solution. 
So thank you. Great. Thank you. And just a point of order to myself. I don't think Councilor Sharazai was done with her questions and I kind of went a little informal there on some dialogue, but certainly appreciate it. Councilor Sharazai. Yes. Um, thank you. <clears throat> so I would, I would push back on, uh, you know, removal of a disclaimer as being a small issue. You know, some of us here on the dais recently went through elections where we were on the other side of that. So I think that it is a big issue. And I think that if you're running for political office or you're supporting candidates, there, there has to be an eye for detail. And I do understand and I support us having a desire to see a diverse set of voices up here. But I don't think that the path to do that is um, by removing penalties for wrongdoing. And so there has to be a standard held. And I would, I would agree with Councillor Mayotte Guerrero's original comment that, you know, we're, you spend pennies to reach tens of thousands of people on social media. And I think that these penalties, um, as they originally stood, made more sense. To me, this feels like, um, and we're sort of taking away the teeth of any ability to enforce an opportunity for people to be transparent in the information that they're sharing. Um, and I, I do think that the, uh, you know, I appreciate uh, City Clerk Rob, and but I don't feel comfortable with us providing an opportunity for this position to use their own discretion. I think that that opens up a lot of opportunity for um, mistrust in that process. You know, if we lay out these are the penalties, this is what you need to do. And the, if that lives outside of that, then there is a fine for that. And I think that that makes it very clear and it, it rules out any sort of uh, undermining of that process. So thank you. Okay. May I respond, Mayor? C can I get, let me sure. just, let me get through the, the group. So I have a, uh, we'll go through the first round and then I'd I'll come like back. I'd like to respond to some comments just made. Okay, I'd like to just get through first because there All might right. be redundant. Okay, fine. So I have uh, Councillor Strom, Stewart, Springsteen, and then we'll go back starting with Councillor Jensen for the second round. Thank you. I would like to second appreciation of uh, being making it eligible to use campaign funds for care. That is amazing. Thank you very much for adding that in. Uh, I, I did have some thoughts and um, ideas, questions, concerns, whatever, as we move through uh, the packet. One of them was, well, for one, on page three, the changing, or I should say, removing of the line about unambiguously referring to any candidate. That line, I will say, I found to be pretty confusing. I do think that we need to discuss explicitly as well as implicitly being for or against candidates. Um, as it was pointed out in uh, public comment ballot question as well as the ballot issues, making sure that we're all encompassing there. Um, I also feel that um, coming back to the comment around online, like the ability to move out and, and communicate to bigger, bigger audiences now is so much less expensive than it has been in certain venues in the past. So revisiting how it is that we are calculating that. I understand wanting to make the dollar amount. I'm glad that you guys are looking at this through the lens of trying to make sure that we're helping people it, it be more e equitable for all to run for office. But at the same time, we do know that there are folks out there that will um, try to skirt the process. And I want to make sure that we're protecting our city from that happening in this age of misinformation and disinformation, really keeping actual information at the forefront and making sure that we are making the system transparent and in very, you know, founded on integrity is important to me. And some of these, I, I understand where you guys were coming with them, but I want to make sure that we are um, not moving away from that ultimate objective. That's all I have. Thank okay. you. So I have Councillor Springsteen and Stewart, then I'll go back to Councillor Abel, and then we'll go through the second round. Councillor Jansen turned her light off, and then we'll go to Councillor Olver. Yeah, I was just wanting to respond to Councillor Sherazai because, I mean, 
if we're talking about leveling the playing field, come on. <laughs> I mean, some of you got elected on major money from Cox, from, um, you know, made developers, National Real Estate Association. We're talking like tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars that back to you as opposed to some of us who got elected on individual donations from individuals. And so to I just find it laughable <laughs> what you said because uh, literally what was occurring is the little guy who has a different opinion was getting picked on and undermined um, in some of these some of these disciplinary actions. And it was extremely unfair and undemocratic. And what this committee has tried to do is to level that playing field a little more, which is really impossible when certain members are backed by so much dark money. So that, that's my comment. Okay, so Councillor Stewart, then Franks. Thanks. I have a couple of comments and then w one question, I believe. Um, so going from the beginning on page three, the definition of electioneering communication, um, I would echo Councillor Strom. I actually pulled up the state definition um, from statute. An electioneering com communication is a communication that unambiguously refers to a candidate and then it has a timeline with within um, the certain point that it needs to be distributed within um, and I would be a little bit more comfortable our original definition was closer to the state statute and I actually think that it might it could could be wise perhaps to just align ourselves with the state statutory um, definition of, of a electioneering communication. Um, and then, let's see, um, on page eight and nine, referring to um, contributions from a candidate committee to not be donated to another candidate or candidate committee, um, Sometimes those funds from a particular candidate committee are transferred to a new candidate committee when that candidate decides to run for a different office. So my question is, does this prohibit that? Because generally a candidate is allowed to use funds that they have raised to then run for potentially a different office if they ever choose to. So that is a question on that definition and whether or not um, that is excluded or included. Um, and then the only other comment that I have is going back to page 22 and 23 with the penalties. I would just echo some concerns about that only because um, when looking at section 2.2, .2, there are two different sections for penalties, 2.2A um, is all persons under groups and committees other than candidate and exploratory committees. And those are the penalties that have been reduced. Um, and to Councillor Olver's point, there often is not a lot that we can do about um, you know, independent expenditures outside of candidate committees. There's only so much that we can do because of the Supreme Court. But I do feel like this section and the penalties for non-candidate committees are one thing that we as a city can do um, because I think it's really important to make sure that folks who are getting communications from committees that are not from the candidate directly, that those disclosures I feel are even more important for transparency purposes. And so it, it feels like in that section, that's not really about the candidates. Um, and section B is the penalties for candidates. And if we notice they are, um, you know, 10% 10 10 of what they are for the organization. So I just wanna make sure that we're holding the right folks accountable to transparency. So those are my comments. Thanks, Councilor Franks. Mm -hmm. 
moving the water carefully so we don't have a <laughs> so sorry you just was like get that one out of the way um, so um, back to uh, Councillor Strom when we we're talking about the electioneering communication um, I did want to kind of circle back and just state that I do agree that I think something that more closely matches state statute just is uh, more comfortable and also um, what I'm going to be trying to do is ensure that um, when people want to run for office or when they want to establish a committee that not only do we have the overarching rules but we've got maybe good user guides communications something that's going to sort of explain some of those things because I think it, it's easy to maybe misunderstand and really call attention to those things so as far as electioneering I would be a little more comfortable with that um, I did want to make sure that on page eight, uh, re kind of returning to what Councillor Stewart was talking about, sort of, nor shall the contributions be donated to another candidate or candidate committee, making sure that we're not violating someone's, like I said, rights in order to move those funds. Um, in full disclosure, I have no funds that are going to be subject to any of this. I will leave office with, with my own debt um, unpaid, but I do want to make sure that others who have done the hard work and who maybe um, are uh, seeking something else that we're not uh, uh, violating any of their rights and regarding uh, the page 22 through 23 um, I definitely would like to be uh, considering some type of a minimum and certainly want to place the higher burden on the groups which would be the more heavily funded so I just wanted to kind of circle back and um, uh, really no questions in there other than the legality on page 8 making sure that that is uh, that stands thanks great all right Councillor Abel and then I have uh Councilors Olver, Matt Guerrero, and Vincent. I will try to answer some of these questions. Firstly, about the degree of a violation, something being more egregious. Any violation in this ordinance is the same as any other violation. I mean, if you take money from a company or a union, you're in violation. Uh, so I, I would say that the I do think there are different degrees of violation and if somebody spends fifty thousand dollars trying to reach every citizen and every voter in Lakewood it's a lot different than some guy from <clears throat> or some person from Ward 3 deciding they want to uh, put out a um, uh, advocacy piece for or against someone and only spending $2,500. And, 20 and it is also the ability to pay. The National Association of Realtors doesn't give a darn about $2,500. They're throwing $30,000 at campaigns right and left. So a little more is not going to hurt them at all. But it does stifle the participation of our local communities uh, members without that kind of resource uh, in their hip pocket. Uh, there was more disinformation coming through those pennies spent in social media in this last election than there was in any other kind of communication. Uh, the state definition of electioneering has been called into question by a judge, and we're a district judge, and we are trying to remedy, get ahead of that by changing this, this electioneering language to reflect what the judge was discussing, and that's something I've asked our attorney to uh, check into. Uh, and, and again, disclosures occur in the same fashion in which the watchdog is not an electioneering communication, social media would not be either. We have various news blogs and opinion blogs and uh, outright BS blogs, but uh, you know, they're all protected. So I, I think that makes a big difference. And the donation transfers, you know, if, if somebody gives me money to spend on my run for city council, 
and I turn around and give it to somebody else, then the donor is not, the donor's wishes are not being heeded. That is also a state law. And that is not new to this document, to this rewrite. That has been one of our uh, requirements, regulations for over a decade. And it is, uh, it's to make sure that money a person donates for one person doesn't finance or donates for one purpose doesn't finance a different purpose. So, um, I think that covers every question that's been raised so far, whether you want to accept my answers or not. Uh, let's go with the next round and I'll see what I can come up with. So I have Councillor uh, Olver, Matt Guerrero, Vincent. Okay, uh, yeah, I would also like to talk about exactly what Councillor Abel was talking about, and it was Councillor Stewart's question. Uh, and it was page eight where we are talking about a candidate not being able to pass along campaign funds to somebody else. And, and I think you have points, but what we were talking or thinking about at that time was... I'll give you a false scenario. Let's suppose I am like super, uh, I have a bunch of millionaire friends and uh, I just feel like getting a, um, and I have a lot of campaign money. Now that's, I mean, my, let's say my pockets are bottomless. <laughs> and, and I come into a council and I am in the mid minority and I never win any votes, right? So two years later I go, hey, all my friends, um, why don't you start doing a little dark money uh, or and even uh, clear money donating to this slate of candidates? And so basically I would have enough money to stack this body that way because we also know that money does count in campaigns. There's just no way around that. It's not necessarily true for all of us right now, but um, or maybe even any of us. But money does count in campaigns, and so the whole purpose of this, this um, new language that we put in was to stop that kind of a thing. So, anyway, um, but I would add, let's see, um, laws are broad, and we're the legislative body, uh, and that laws are broad by design. We talked about the uh, the different scenarios that you could come up with, um, the penalties for this, the penalty for that, this should be smaller, this should be bigger. And quite simply, we started throwing everything in we could think of. This, this paper would be 100 pages long. And, and then we'd still miss some. And so that's why we, some of it, you know, you could, I mean, if you want to make uh, changes to it, you know, I think we'll all listen. Um, but <coughs> And in the, in the end, for me, we can't do every scenario. We can't do every penalty um, in here. And we're just going to have to say, well, that's illegal at times. Okay. Thank you. Councilor Mayotte Greer. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I just want to reiterate, I know, I know that uh, Councilor Abel and um, Councilor Olver both both said this, but I, as it kind of came up again in the line of questioning, just to reiterate that this, in its current state, does not attempt to take on independent expenditures, also fondly referred to by people as dark money, um, just so that like people can keep track of what we're talking about. That's IE committees, um, independent expenditures. Uh, and so that's not in here. And so just to be clear, this, like, this, as this is written, would not actually do anything to change, alter, or reduce IEs because that is a federal Supreme Court situation um, at this point, which is uh, unfortunate. Um, and then I, I did want to also make sure that we were able to just bring to the front that the component about um, 
us elected and then staff not spending money on candidates is about spending public money, not their own money. Of course, not being allowed to spend your own money would be disenfranchisement of your First Amendment rights. So just to be extremely clear that it's about not spending public money, which already would have not been allowed. Um, and then, yeah, just to double down on the idea of wanting to get make sure that we get that legal analysis of the being able to move money from one committee to another, I, I, I think that you can't do that already by state law. I don't think that that's like a new thing in the city level. And then um, the last thing which has not come up yet is just within those pages 22 and 23, um, pointing out that there is a, essentially a calls for the city clerk to be able to uh, alert folks that their reports have not gone through or did not show up um, within three days. And I know that there was a little bit of discussion at the time about um, whether or not that was burden on the clerk during a really busy season, which is election season. And so just wanted to throw out there too that I'm hoping that within this next iteration of, of legal and staff analysis, we find out if that's actually reasonable or not reasonable in terms of, we obviously don't wanna let people off the hook when we knew in advance that we bureaucratically weren't gonna be able to get there. Um, we don't wanna you know, put things, but we wanna make sure that people are experiencing timely. And I remember that being a discussion at the time and that was something Mr. Abbey, you were like, I think it's all right, but let me like think a little bit. So I just wanted to reflag that too. Um, yeah, and it sounds like everybody's getting hung up on the same thing. I, I have a just a process question, um, which is, why is this discussion not a study session? Is this all, is this always what happens with committee drafts? Please. Uh, our other concern is that we're making rules that will cover the upcoming election. They won't take effect for right. 30 days. And we already have an announcement. So the person, the people that announce now will be operating under different rules for the first 30 days. And then there will be new rules added. So it's, it's a matter of getting something done in as hasty a manner as possible. We had, we had tried to schedule our first, our starting point on the rewrite uh, a couple of months earlier and didn't, uh, could not accomplish that. So it is a matter of the timing when staff was uh, allowed, but I think the sooner we get something done, the better, and waiting another week for a study session and might not have been able to schedule it then anyway. And can I add just a bit to what Councillor Abel just said? We also couldn't find a study session in quick enough time to accomplish what he's saying. And this is very time sensitive because next week is a Martin Luther King that we lose a study session, et cetera. So um, this is somewhat unusual, but we really wanted to get this conversation in so we can move forward to formalize. Thank you so much, both of you, for your answers. Okay, I have uh, Councillor Vincent. Um, I just want to, I hadn't commented before, but because everybody Sorry. kind of brought up the same concerns that I had, and that is um, the one on 22 and 23, I'd like to see a, a standard amount on that to take the transparency question and anything that may happen. Um, so I wanted um, my constituents to understand that. Um, I have a question about when we're talking about transferring money. Maybe I misunderstood. I thought maybe we were talking about I, Sharon, am running. I'm a city councilor. Now I decide I want to run for mayor or state rep. Are we talking about not being able to transfer that money? I see, see, I see some people going like this and some people going like this. So I need a, I need a clarification because I think the question's out there. So go ahead and clarify, I think, Councillor Stewart, that's your follow-up question also, yeah. Oh, okay. Um, I'm sorry, will you refresh my memory on? Yes, I was asking, uh, we talked about transferring funds, and All I right. think it got kind of hung up in right. issue committees. 
I thought the question was is if I'm running, I'm a city councilor now, now I want to run for mayor or state rep, can I transfer my monies that's in that account to my own campaign or are you saying no? It's my, un it's my understanding that state law says no. I don't, my concern is that we have had people in the past who have transferred money from their campaign to someone else's campaign. So somebody who's willing to support Sharon is probably willing to support Sharon for any office she wishes to seek. So I, I, I'm not sure how the law shakes out on that. I think would we might have to, I don't know, Ms. McKinney, would we have to make an exception to state law to allow that? Because state law does not do it. We have had cases come up where people have loaned themselves money and then took that amount out of their uh, war chest and transferred it to someone else and the hearing officer said that's okay if it's you're paying back a loan you're just leaving out the middle step so you you take your loan the money the money you loaned yourself out and transfer it to someone else I believe the hearing yeah, officer the said floor. that's okay so okay. what would you have us do I I'm going to try to restate it. So I have a thousand dollars in my, you know, account from running, and it's just sitting there. So now I decide I want to run for mayor in the city of Lakewood. I I need to know what to do with that. Can I transfer it to my new campaign, or do I have to close it out, and then go through the whole process? Is that is that? Did I clarify it a little better? Yeah, so, it does. Uh, it's my understanding that state law does not allow that I don't think I have any problem with it if you would like to propose a change we can change this to make that clear because we're a home rule city we can supersede state law but you would have to have a majority of us agree to it so but if you want to have that in the rewrite I think we could or in the What's brought back to us uh, for final consideration, first and second reading, we could do that. Yeah. Could we not, Mr. Rob? Well, and, and as a time check, and I can come back to you, but certainly we know that this is going to have to go for a full legal review. And when that's done, that's going to answer a lot of these questions. Sure. And then from there, there will probably be amendments that council will want to make based mm -hmm. upon the conversations. And so um, that's probably the, the next steps. I don't know if we'll be able to satisfy everybody's answers tonight or questions, right. but certainly the consensus should be send it for legal review. And then um, once that's done, then we move forward with the readings where we can do the amendments. Sure. And that's forward. the purpose yep. of this session, yep. this presentation. So I, I have... I have a Christmas tree up here still. <laughs> I have uh, Councillor Stewart, Strom, Franks, Paul, and Olver. Thanks. I will be brief. I, I just wanted to echo that the question I was actually asking was the one that Councillor Vincent asked, not the one that got answered a couple of times. Um, it, it is not legal, in my understanding, it is not legal for me, candidate Rebecca Stewart, with my candidate committee to then donate all the money in my committee to Sharon Vincent's campaign for re-election. That has never been legal. That is not what I was asking. I was asking if I, Rebecca Stewart, with money in my campaign committee, with the, so this will be answered with legal review because my understanding is actually that it is legal for me to take the money in my candidate committee and put it towards a run for a different office. So um, I don't think we need to clear that up tonight. That was the question I was asking with this language is we need to make sure that, that it doesn't prohibit something that is actually legal um, because I believe that that is. So um, no further questions. I know that will, I just wanted to clarify that I wasn't asking if, to do something illegal. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Okay, so I have Councillor Strom. I'm happy to wait for legal review. Okay. Councillor Franks. 
Well, uh, first, I, I forgot to mention earlier, thanks to the committee for all the work. I, I know this is, this is hard work. Um, and I have not read this at the level that others have. So what I want to make sure that I understand is when we get to page 22 and 23, where we have 2.2 talking about a hearing officer may, but then in the future ones, we switch to a city clerk. Can someone help me understand the dividing line? Is a hearing officer an external person we hire, and they're gonna take care of 2.2, but then the other, the B, um, falls back to the city clerk and the 2.3 falls back. So I guess I'm just not understanding the alignment of that, that there are there certain situations where you guys discuss that a hearing officer needs to be invoked for X, but the city clerk for Y and Z. Is that what I'm seeing? Okay. Yeah, Councillor, thank you. That's my understanding. There's a, there's a dividing line between when an, an infraction necessitates a fine from the city clerk or it goes to a hearing for the determination of a hearing officer. Okay, and so what I think I'll do is just do a little bit deeper dive to see if that makes sense. It's almost like I need a matrix, like a like a chart that would say if this, then this. So it could it would make better sense in my mind, like when it hits a certain threshold or a criteria that oh it meets these criteria, therefore it's got to go down the path of a hearing officer. But if it falls into these criteria, it's city clerk because I think that's going to help me sort out then the shall versus may and where the response. Does that all make sense? I'm just trying to sort that out in my head on the fly tonight's not the night so if we could just have that for the next uh, step that would be helpful may I okay the uh, the hearing officer is only invoked if there is a campaign violation filed by a community member short of that there are other regulations that are just sort of pro forma mistakes not actual campaign finance violations but mistakes you know we're a couple of days late with our reports or our, uh, three days after we file our report the clerk notices a mechanical error or a mathematical error those sort of things are handled by the clerk and our former city clerk, Karen Goldman, who has been in the, the clerk in business forever in this state and as a well-respected authority, brought up that very thing that the clerk should not have this decision-making. Should They either should have to do it or have to refer it to somebody else. But to say they may decide leaves them in kind of a ticklish political situation. So we're try I was trying to avoid that with the shalls and maids. So, and, and I think that is something we should do in the, re in the next version that comes to us is make it shall so that we don't have a pejorative uh, reaction to a clerk's decision. It's, it's unfair to put them in that position. And I appreciate Ms. Goldman bringing that up. It's something we, we wouldn't have thought of, I don't think. Okay, Councillor Older, and then I'm gonna try to get us to some consensus. <laughs> Uh, I had a quick one here. Um, back to uh, Councillor Vincent's and uh, Stewart's point of passing money along to yourselves. It sounds, seems to me that's perfectly legal um, by that word that another. It says, nor shall the contributions be donated to another candidate. I mean, you're the same candidate. So I say this is this wording that is sitting here right now allows that. For, both, for everything, and then, then it gets, uh, well, but you know, if you come up with some better wording, fine, but I think we're good right now. Okay, so we've been able to talk a lot about this, and it seems clear that we need to go to legal um, and then have it, it come back, and then what I would do is when that comes back is encourage, encourage council to work 
with legal on potential amendments, if that's agreeable. Uh, one thing I would just like to state, I don't know if there is a threshold as to what point, depending on our time frame, um, how does this affect, is it, I think we will potentially see more people start to file for the election. So how does that start to impact and uh, where's the fairness as we move forward? So I don't expect to have an answer for that tonight, but I think council needs to keep that in consideration. Councilor Abel, imagine you have We had the same dilemma the last time uh, campaign finance rewrite came to us. It came to us in the middle of an election cycle and there was a deadline of February 1st for it to take place. So everything that was done before, or maybe it was March 1st, but everything that was done, every announcement of a candidate operated under different rules from the time they announced until the, when this uh, new campaign, latest campaign finance uh, directive came into effect, and that's what we're facing now. Same old thing. If we delay it, then it's delayed for another two to four years, and another campaign finance committee. So. Okay. So I think we're good there. Thank you, committee, for your work, and um, we'll continue to move on. All right, general business pertaining to tonight's agenda. I'm going to turn it over to Councillor Jansen, who has a uh, request for council action. <clears throat> Thank you, Mayor. Um, so I would like to amend the City Council Policy and Procedures Manual Section 04.01 to add a public safety committee. And I would like the council members to have an opportunity to, to get, discuss this matter, including composition of the committee and objectives. Um, we could possibly discuss this as our, our retreat on January 28th, or, okay, 28th. And um, I mean, this is, I'm putting it this out there. I really would like to, I think, I think this is something that we really need to put together. Um, I know our citizens are pretty um, frustrated. Um, the crime rates are one of the top issues affecting our citizens and other municipalities such as Aurora have committees to evaluate and recommend public safety policy changes. And I think the citizens would appreciate that we're looking into ways to help out and fight, fight this crime. Because um, crime not only affects the victim, it affects the population and insurance rates and overall well-being of our citizens. And I'm just putting this out there. And if you guys could come up with some ideas and some thoughts. So when we get together um, at our retreat, I'd like to bring this up. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Maya Guerrero. Um, I think that increasing amounts of particularly petty crime is definitely something I'm also hearing about. I think I have a, a couple of questions and they might be for you, Councilor James, but they also just might be for staff for the next thing. I think it's a great idea to talk about this. Um, so some of the things that just come to my mind immediately um, are around, I know that there's some level of stress that's been put on our municipality um, due to the lack of like open floor at the county jail um, and wanting to think about the way that we may need to be approaching a regional or countywide response and that can't ultimately be our, um, it's just not our jurisdiction, right? We can't actually make that happen. Um, and so wanting to just make sure that we have this discussion be really localized, really specific and like within Lakewood's control. And then my other question is why make a, so this is a task force committee. What was the phrase you used? Public safety. Yeah, but Public. committee. Um, and if that would be then, if we should make an extension of the LAC and also for us to, in all the questions that you just asked, which I think are great, for us to particularly um, think about the makeup between staff, humans in the commit, community and then also elected folks, us, um, as all key components of that. And I also, I love the phrase public safety personally because I think I take a wider lens on what public safety means than maybe some do, but 
We know that the other things that are happening is that the percentage of people who are housing insecure due to, due to rising rent costs and you know wages that aren't keeping up and uh, continuing business sector that we're like doing good things to invigorate but that you know could use more etc cetera, etc cetera, are all also things that are definitely committed or uh, contributing to people's desperation so I would also really encourage us all as we talk about this um, to think about really what is the potential of a group like this and what's the best way to, to spend and hone time and to have clear objectives that are really um, not just about punishment and being punitive, but also about prevention. And we know that crime prevention um, comes from investing in like social programs and social well-being for our, our community. Great, thanks. Councilor Springsteen? Yeah, I wanted to thank Councilor Jansen for bringing this idea forward. Uh, to some degree, I've been trying to bring this idea forward for some time. Um, we had a, a comment from, from Josh Compton, in, and I just wanted to read one part of it, where he said, is the intention is to have oversight over those who hold a monopoly of violence, view public safety holistically by investigating root causes and designing nonviolent interventions the committee could make substantial, long-lasting, positive impacts. I think that that's such an important comment. And I also think it's important um, because, you know, something I've just talked about in the last few weeks is our City of Lakewood Community Survey in which 89% um, of respondents were white and 0% were African American. And, um, you know, just going back to the idea that this would not become another tool of oppression, you know, which would aid in excuses of racial profiling or something of that nature. I think we need to address both public safety and crime but also how, how to make our police force the best they can be. And um, so I think clearly defining the objectives and purposes of this committee is a really important one. And that, you know, that is something Mr. Compton had said as well. So thanks. Okay. So get your ideas in to Councillor Jensen, Councillor Abel. Um, Councillor Jensen, do you how do you envision this committee? Would it be would it include community members? Would it just be council? That's that's what I, I want to talk about. I'd like to sit down with Kathy and kind of talk about staff, how to staff it. Um, so within the next week or so before our retreat have maybe that part in you know coming in with something going on and then having you everybody at the retreat kind of put something into it because I totally get where, where it needs to go you know I'm, I'm envisioning a lot of different things um, it can't be too big because <laughs> no. nothing will ever get done so but it you know I'd like to have a business community, you know, talk about the theft that's going on in there and how they've been handling it or, or just invite them into the, to the committee, you know, and talk about it. Um, uh, for sure, counselors, staff, I'd like to see someone from the police department, maybe even somebody from Jeffco, sheriff's department, maybe, I don't know. So just so we can get something working, it just doesn't seem that People are so frustrated, they just don't know what to do. No, I, I'm aware of that, yes. believe me, but thank you. Okay, Councilor Oliver. Uh, have we've, are we still on new or general business? Because I, I don't have anything to follow up on that. But yep, general I, business pertaining to our agenda. What does that mean? I mean, when we want to discuss something in the past that we did it now under general business. So do you, we now have to have things on the agenda to discuss things under general business? Well, certainly you have a counselor comment opportunity. 
and because of a notice of claim, we're trying to keep things directed to our agenda. Notice and of what's counselor, a notice? I don't uh, know what a notice of claim is. Okay. There's a memo from our city attorney referencing a notice of claim presented by another council member and a legal opinion from outside council as to how council should conduct their business in uh, public. So then how do we bring up new ideas and new business? When? When and how? So do we do it under council reports? Certainly we can reports. do it under council reports. I just I want to tread a uh, little bit lightly and, and make sure people have the opportunity. But council reports is purely council, but this is general business under the agenda is what I would like to stick to. Councilor Jansen did submit a request for council action, so those are also available to us. But I think until we have some resolution to the notice of claim based upon our attorney's advice, I'd like to try to, uh, as a responsibility to our community, a fiduciary responsibility, uh, obey that advice, which keeps us to our agenda. But I think under councilor comments, you're certainly welcome. I don't follow, truthfully. Uh, what I was going to talk about is somewhat connected, but not really connected to what Councillor Jansen was talking about. Um, but she was talking about the retreat, and I wanted to talk about that. So I think I'm going to continue because I think I'm not far away from it. So, and, and in fact, I, I was looking for a clarification from our city manager because at this retreat we're talking priorities and what we're now talking about is one of the possible priorities that we're going to hit there. I was going to ask you how many priorities can the city handle? And the background there is that right now for last year we came up with six. And the year before I think it was five or six. And the year before the same number. But like we look at last year's and public safety wasn't a priority of this council, but it really is. I mean, we all know there's not one person up here that's going to say public safety, we don't care. Um, everybody is going to say, yes, that's a priority of the city of Lakewood and they'd be right. And, and the same thing with economic development. That was, that is not a priority last year. That was not set, excuse me, as a priority. It was brought up, but it wasn't set as a priority. So my question is then to the city manager is how many priorities can we actually come up with? Because, you know, there's, there's parks, there's police, there's, you know, potholes, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And if we limit ourselves to five or six, we're leaving something out that I think is a biggie. So I would, uh, you know, and there's 11 of us. So, you know, and if we all got two, then there's 22 can you handle 22 priorities? I, I don't think you'd want to, but you know, I'm, I'm saying that I think we should in, in, increase the number of priorities that we come up with at our city planning. I think public safety should be one of them. Um, whether we do that in a committee or in another different way, that's fine, but it should be a priority. So is there a problem with adding more priorities? Um, thank you for the question. You're right, there are six right now, six mm. priorities established by the City Council. <clears throat> That's pretty common. I want to say we have had five or six over several, several years. And it's really a matter of the, the magnitude of the policy. So, um, it, so it's really your decision at the retreat to decide what do you really want to focus on. And you establish those broad policy issues, and then at the retreat, better specify for staff what what what's really meaningful under that. For example, um, a priority you've had for a long uh, several years now is the unhoused population homelessness. So, what staff needs to hear f as a result of this retreat is, where do, give us some clarification. Be, be clear with what's really important. And I, we're hearing from you and from our partners and from our community that what's really important right now, potentially, this is a potential um, priority for you, that would be the short-term severe weather um, kind of housing. And maybe that's where you really want staff to focus. So 
this all is a big negotiation that happens at your retreat, and it's important that the majority of you all agree on what those priorities are. Um, so having said that, if I can't really answer how many we can tolerate or how many we can, um, how many is too many for staff, but as we have this conversation, it'll be really fluid and we'll continue to talk about, well, what does that mean? So you'll bring up a priority, whatever that might be, and we'll talk about what are those resources that are necessary? How much staff time will that take? Um, and how, what kind of financial commitment might that be? And from that, then you decide where do you want, where do you want those priorities to be if, about, you know, with your particular um, interest. Right. So uh, police, public safety has been a priority in the past. I wouldn't say as a result that it's not one of the six that we don't really have an emphasis. If you look at our budget, we, um, there is a lot of money that's attributed to those kind of programs, police and other kind of responses. So that all gets negotiated at the retreat. Right, but you can go over six. And what you're saying, what I'm hearing you say is that, yeah, we can go over six and you would actually like us to be a little more specific yes. than, than to just say public safety or sustainability. In fact, if like we said, my example is, if we said sustainability, we could say uh, recycling and tree canopy. Or That's it. something like that. Or if yes. we said public safety, then we could say, uh, let's see, we should finance uh, laptop computers so that, right. that our police can go to um, the, the flea markets and look for stolen goods. I mean, it's something uh, very specific. Whatever, but, or expand the co-responder program right, or but, whatever well, that yeah, might be. But we should be thinking, we're all thinking about our priorities right now and will be for the next few weeks. But we should be thinking about not just, oops, call it sustainability and, ho and affordable housing, but we should be thinking about smaller things too, specific things. That's, that's where I was hoping to go. Okay. Yeah. That's right, thank and, you. Thanks. And counselors Abel and Stewart are tasked with helping to plan, and so I think they'll be having some correspondence coming out. And what I might say, and, and we haven't done this for a while because it is, it's quite an exercise, but we do have core community values as a city council, and they're in the back, they're on the website, and the first core community value is safe community. So, and if you just go on the website and Google that, you'll see um, the city council's commitment to citizens as well as our core community values. Councilor Abel. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, it's my recollection that last year, Ms. Hodgson, it's my recollection that last year at retreat, we came up with six priorities and you said we can only do three of them. I know they were, but that was the comment. Uh, I don't remember saying that, Councillor Abel. Okay. No, certainly I think when we prioritized everything that this council prioritized was put forth, it's on our dashboard. Homelessness, emergency response, workforce housing, distressed properties, safe lots rental housing options and additional dog parks is what's on there. And then there was an additional, as you drilled down, one of the ones that was brought forth public safety by Councilor Jansen was um, a reboot of Neighborhood Watch. And so that was another piece of kind of the drill down of some of the other ancillary things. I hope this adds to the clarity. There are also other uh, initiatives that are brought up by Council that that are sorted in other areas, like some of them might fit nicely in an assignment for the LAC, for example. Others fit nicely, not, not, they're not really broad policy, but it's you'd like to see staff work on a specific something because you're seeing something not work very well. So that's not really a big policy issue, but that's something that's of deep concern to your community. And it's something that all of council will agree that needs to be looked at. So besides um, the broad priorities and then the goals underneath those, or you can say goals and the priorities underneath those. We also have abilities to send some of these smaller items to other resources. For example, LAC who really look forward to assignments. Cool. 
Why don't you just keep the mic and take us to your executive report? Thank you. I just have a few things that I wanted to comment on. So hot off the press, um, I have a draft copy of the presentation that's going to the um, school board, the Board of Education, and it's going to happen on January 11th. So this is just a draft copy. The reason for me bringing this to your attention is they will be proposing, this is all about the disposition of the schools that are being closed. And there's a whole process that's being proposed. And we have an opportunity to have a voice representing our constituents during this process. So I'm going to stay really close to this and to make sure I'm continuing to communicate out um, to you and and certainly uh, via this this recording so that if people want to get involved, they can. Um, and there's a whole hierarchy of how they're going to look at this. The first step is, is there a reuse for the district? for the district itself. So that's kind of their first priority. And then they're gonna to talk to the communities and look at the schools geographically, where they fall, what do the communities, so what do the municipalities wanna see as it relates to the schools that are being vacated? And then they're gonna talk about um, leasing, um, sale of property, et cetera. So I would think this, this process would be of, of real interest to you and to your constituents. So I may be annoying, but I'm going to continue to try to invite you and certainly our community members to get involved in this process. I think it's important, especially in light of the fact that many of these schools are tucked into neighborhoods and a reuse of some kind um, could be um, distasteful to our citizens. So we would want, want to make sure we represent that. Um, second of all, I just got this in the mail today and I wanted to announce that CML, Colorado Municipal League, through the Metro City Attorneys Association recognized two of our staff, outstanding city attorney, Allison McKinney-Brown, and then outstanding assistant city attorney, Gus Skank, were both um, awarded um, and are, were recognized statewide. So congratulations to you and to Gus. Finally, I wanted to make just a couple of comments about this recent storm that we had. It was an unusual storm. And the reason it was unusual, you probably all know, oh, actually it was on December 28th and lasted to December 29th. And we had very cold temperatures at the time. And the storm started with a really heavy rain then the temperatures really dropped. So that created um, unusual characteristics for us. We also had then followed up with another smaller storm on January 1st through the 3rd. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about the response that our public works uh, department did. Um, and remember, we have a new public works director. So we're learning a lot together. And he's bringing some really good information to us that's making, I think, improving our processes. So it was kind of like we had an April storm in December because of the rain in advance. Um, the first storm we got two inches per hour for about eight or nine hours. Do you remember that right after Christmas? Official totals uh, ranged between 8.5 inches to 14 inches across the city. Ward four, 14 inches, I can attest. Um, and then uh, the New Year's Day event, um, the snow totals were 1.3 to 1.7, just to add insult to injury, and then we had very low temperatures. Um, our priority one and priority two um, routes were completed by noon on the 29th. P priority three, okay, so priority one, just to remind you for citizens who are listening, priority one are the busy arterial and major collector streets. Priority twos are the school zones, shopping areas, and minor collector streets. I think Max Kirschbaum has sent this to you. And the priority three are residential, residential streets that we don't always plow, but the decision was made to plow because of the extent of the storm. Um, most residentials were done after midnight on the 30th of December. We did run into some, some problems. and we really are listening to the concerns that we're hearing from the citizens to try to make this better. Um, we did experience some difficulties, especially in those, again, kind of Ward 4 area. We've got a lot of cul-de-sacs. We've got really tough topography. 
And when you think about a cul-de-sac, um, it's hard to get in and then turn around for a big wide plow and to come back out. Like I said, we have a new team in place. We're discussing strengths and weaknesses already and we'll continue to do so because our goal is to be the best and we're always working to improve our operations. A couple, a couple of things we want to do to help if indeed we have another storm like this. We, and um, remember Jay Hutchison, our former public works director, he worked with Kyle Beck, our former streets um, manager, and they put together an FAQ so that you would all have it, um, uh, the questions that are pretty typical during the storm, so you would all have that. We'll also post that online. It just needs to be updated a little bit. City Council hasn't gotten that for a couple, several years, we're thinking four or five, you might remember it. And I think it was really helpful, so we're gonna do that again. Another thing we're gonna do is think about using our neighborhood support team to help better organize for our neighbors who can't get out and shovel themselves. Or there's a rent windrow that's been created in front of their driveway and it really limits their ability to get around because they, for whatever reason, can't do it themselves. So we wanna be a, a little more proactive as it relates to our response and helping neighbors help neighbors. Um, uh, finally, there are some ways that residents can help. Um, if it's at all possible when we have a storm like this, if people can, can get off the street, if they can, if at all possible and park on the driveway so that the plows can get through, that'll be, that'll um, really be advantageous for the plows trying to get through. Please clear your sidewalks for pedestrians. Everyone needs to because the streets now are more narrow. If the sidewalks aren't cleared, the people are having to walk in these narrow streets where the cars are, are moving and there's a, there's a safety concern there. And um, clear your neighbor, neighbor's sidewalk if you can to lend a hand because not everyone, like I said earlier, can do that. This team is pretty good and very responsive. They're still out there cleaning the, that hard ice right now with graders and they'll be doing that all week. If there's a pain spot or a problem area, um, please go online, go to Request Lakewood, or there's a, a phone number, 303-987-7950, that you can report an area. I'll say that slower. 303-987-7950 that people can call, give an address, and say, this is a bad spot, and we really need some help. Um, so, again, we're listening carefully to the concerns, and we're, uh, we're just dedicated to find good solutions. And with that, that concludes my report. Thank you. Thank you. Nicely done. Okay. Let's go ahead and move into council reports. Is there a ward that wants to go first? Just jump in. Ward two. Ward two. <laughs> we'll go ward two, then ward three, and up and down. Okay. Um, all right, Ward 2 um, wanted to flag that we will be having our Ward 2 meeting at the Clements Community Center, which is the usual place, but it's been a while, so very excited to have that opportunity to give some folks some updates and really to, to get some feedback as we're going into that, you know, priority planning as has been message, as has been talked about this evening. Um, that is at 6 p.m. at the Clements Community Center on Wednesday the 18th. Um, I want to give a shout out to Ward 2 during this last cold spell. Uh, we had two churches that stepped up. One was St. Bernadette's that took people during the, the daytime hours, and then we had United Methodist Church that took people overnight. And um, Councilor Matt Guerrero was very instrumental in that. And then um, we had Councilor Shirazari and also um, the mayor. Adam Paul um, coming and helping with that and the community response was great I mean they came in took it and ran with it um, so I, I think we did a great job on that and the church is getting together and outreach for people um, and then I kind of like to back up what I think it was Councillor Stewart brought up 
maybe a month or so ago, saying that we have cold weather now. And I remember sitting here and having great lengthy discussions about that we need to offer all these safe parking places. And to date, we're going to have a six-month review, and we have one. So it's one thing to sit here at council and say, we need all this, but we need to step these things up. We have people who are hurting, and they are hurting in all wards. And, and it shouldn't be just one section of the city that steps up to this. That's my, that's my belief. Um, so I would like to encourage people to look at additional safe parking initiatives. And congratulations to Ward 2 for stepping up. I will say that, and you too. Thank you. All right, Ward 3. I'm happy to go. I uh, just wanted to let the community know that we have a ward meeting on January 21st. Um, it's moved up one week because we have a retreat the following week. So I'd love to hear from you um, about what you would like me to bring to our council retreat. It's going to be again Saturday, January 21st, 930 to 1030 a.m at Phillips United Methodist. We'll also be getting a really fabulous update from the Lakewood Advisory Commission. They gave a great presentation at council. So if you missed it, they are going to be um, joining us and uh, chatting about the great work that they do and hoping to get more people involved. Um, and uh, to tee off of what uh, Councilor Olver and Mayor Paul said, um, we should be getting out some communication to the rest of council regarding retreat. Um, very presently. Yeah, I wanted to just report on what I consider an extremely significant event that occurred on December 23rd when the executive director, Jeff Roberts, of the Colorado Freedom of Information Coalition wrote a blog about our very council and it's called Lakewood City Council members criticize mayor for muting their mics during Zoom meeting. Um, this is the preeminent uh, place where First Amendment rights are discussed in the state and went out across the state to the legal community. And um, it was regarding the mayor cutting off uh, or muting three counselors at the December 19th meeting regarding the city manager's employment contract. And just a couple of things I'd like to point out that Steve Zansberg, who's the preeminent First Amendment attorney in the state said, is that there's an independent right of people to receive information that these council members, they're elected representatives wish to impart on subjects before the council, the mayor cannot exercise his mute button authority to silence any comment that disagrees with his position. And I think that's such an important statement from um, somebody that everybody in the state recognizes and respects. Uh, the only other comment I wanted to make a further concern is why the city manager's employment contract had to be ramrodded through by way of muting dissenting counselors and taking a premature vote with hands still raised for questions on that evening. The optics of that and of this entire article are absolutely mortifying for this city. And um, I hope a lot of people pay attention. Thanks. Thank you. Ward 4. Thanks. Um, I just wanted to uh, thank the community for reaching out with, um, you know, certainly with the uh, snowstorms and the challenges that we had and giving us very specific feedback. Certainly we forwarded that off to staff. I want to thank uh, Ms. Hodson for, you know, having several conversations about sort of how we can look towards maybe mapping problem areas where we just know there's certain areas 
where we can look at the neighborhood support uh, team coordinator to kind of pull some of those resources together. Um, also from an education standpoint, I think we've got a lot of folks who um, are moving in from climates that maybe um, aren't familiar sort of with the struggles that can go on and so maybe don't know to not only clean the walk but a little bit on the curb so you get that runoff and that drainage because in Ward 4 with our topography, unfortunately, uh, if you don't and it just pools in front of driveways and then becomes another issue. So I certainly wanted to uh, thank everyone for reaching out, but continue to reach out with ideas, problem spots to the number, to us. We want to pass those on. The goal is to really look at how we can um, respond um, to unusual events, but also just heavy snow in general and, and make it a, a better process. But I really wanted to acknowledge also in Ward 4 as I drove around seeing groups of neighbors shoveling out sort of ends of cul-de-sacs and cleaning walkways of our elderly and folks who are disabled. And it just warmed my heart to see the community come together. But we do know we have a lot of work to do. So thanks. And I would follow up on that. Um, I received more complaints or comment complaints um, on this storm and and how we removed this or didn't remove some of the snow than I've ever seen on any other issue that we've had here before. Uh, and and I've uh, been in email contact with our public works director and and asked. So basically, the very first complaint I got was from somebody who was on a dead-end street. Or you can call them cul-de-sacs. I'm going to call them dead-end streets. I, I think of a cul-de-sac of like maybe four houses. But these are, I looked, it was 15, 14 houses. And it was never touched. And so I asked our, our director, uh, did we not plow cul-de-sacs or dead-end streets? And his reply was, yes, that is part of the residential streets in Lakewood. But then I went out, and then we started getting more complaints. And I went out last week and drove around Ward 4 for a couple of hours, and I could not find one cul-de-sac that had been plowed or one dead-end street. And so on recommendations as to how we can improve this, I was like, let's start, let's start plowing everybody. I mean, it, we said we plowed everybody. We did not. Uh, and you know, and there was people say, saying things like, "Oh, do I get to pay less taxes now?" And of course, they can't. <laughs> and so, that's definitely one of the things uh, I would point out. I, somehow, our mapping is wrong. Um, somehow, our drivers weren't told to plow cul-de-sacs. I, I, I don't really know what happened, but maybe it was a communication breakdown. Maybe it was something else. Um, but yeah, definitely it was a very wet snow, but I would never call it uh, unusual because that's all we ever get is unusual storms. You know, when we get up upslope conditions, we're going to get dumped on. And, and this one, you pointed out, it started out as rain, and that's why Ward 4 got hit the most because we're higher, so we're colder. And it's still raining down maybe here, and it's snowing up at my house. And so we got a lot of snow, and then the bottom layer was soaking wet, and it was really difficult to move. So that brings up another point. This time around, in my, well, everywhere, really, uh, we went to single lane plowing. I, that's new to me, and I've been in my house for 20-some years. Um, they just ran the plows down the middle of the road and, and called it good. And that is not how it used to be. And so are we doing that to save money? Because truthfully, I don't love the, the plan. And talking to the director, you know, it, it, he never said that it was to save money. He, he was talking about, well, there's cars alongside, and you mentioned that. Um, and so you don't want to get close to those. And, and certainly you don't want people out cleaning out their driveway, getting out to the one little lane, and then a truck coming along and plowing them back in. We hate that. <laughs> we all hate that. I'm sure everybody agree on that one. But I thought there was time because, um, let's see, what was it, the 29th? There was very little traffic moving. I mean, everybody said, ah, I'm going to stay home. It's a, it's a snow day. And so I thought we could keep going. So did we have manpower shortages? Um, 
are we going to continue to do this single lane plowing? I guess that would be the first question. So I think the best way to answer this, Councillor Olver, is um, uh, I talked about the FAQ, mm -hmm. and the best person to respond to this is really the public works staff to talk about the science behind plowing streets. That really isn't um, something that I can do right now, probably or ever. And but but he's really that person. So let's look at the FAQ. I'm sure he's listening online, and we'll add the questions that you're asking to his um, report. Then, if there's a need for a further conversation or something that might have budget implications, um, we'll have that conversation as a full city council. Okay. Yep. And yeah. I don't know when that will be out, but I, lay, I hope we can have that done. It's really just a modification of one that's already been constructed. So I'm thinking we can get that out in the next week or so. Again, just for clarification, we'll make sure each one of you gets that to help answer questions from your constituents. And we'll also post it online. So it's made available to whoever is interested in um, those right. answers to the frequently asked questions. Do you think the single lane plowing was for budget considerations or physics? Something else? I really, I really can't answer that. But I also know, and I don't really want to go too much in the weeds, but we don't want to go curb to curb. So well, if, you can't. first of all, there's often cars parked on the street, so you can't. But secondarily, what you've done if you go curb to curb is you've pushed all the snow on the sidewalks. And now you've made it the windrows are on your sidewalk. So, and with this wet, heavy, extremely cold storm that we've had, we're making it really tough for kids who are going to school or I, there's trillions of people walking dogs, at least in my neighborhood, and it makes it really tough. So it's a hard situation. And this really was an unusual storm. Usually we have the advantage of nice weather or at least sun. Sun comes out and it really helps melt naturally, melts the storm. And we didn't get that for several days. So if, if we'd hold our questions until we get the FAQ and then we'll have um, answers that are from people who really are bright and really work in this area and have for a long time. Is that fair? It is. Um, and okay. I would look forward to speaking with Max because I would... You know, the, the single lane plowing is new to me, and maybe it's a good idea. Um, I don't know, and some more information would be great. Great. He's the guy. Okay. Ward five, then one. Sorry. Yeah, because we went two, three, four. Five, okay, I'll make this four. quick. And um, <clears throat> mine's not more anything ward or city. But I have a community safety alert. So I belong to an organization called Dangerous Games Children Play. And um, there is a TikTok blackout challenge called, um, and it's um, called, the, we call it, well, we called it the choking game. And I lost my son to this. So I just want to make sure that parents are talking to their children, making sure they're not doing this. I know I didn't know anything about it. Um, and if anybody has any questions or any concerns, they can call me. Um, you know, sometimes it just kind of creeps up on us. So that's just all I have right now. Thanks, Wendy. Thank you for sharing. Thank you. Thank you. Um, ward meeting January was canceled as um, much of the world was maybe still stuck in an airplane trying to come home from holiday break. I don't know, but the ward meeting was canceled this past Friday or Saturday. Uh, in lieu of that, I will be holding office hours at the council offices um, Thursday morning between 8.30 and 10.30. If anybody would like to pop in, um, we have coffee in there, um, coffee and conversation. Uh, so that'll be going on. And then we do have our next Ward 5 meeting coming up on Saturday, February 4th at Westwoods Community Church um, to be determined if we can continue via hybrid. So for right now, safe assumption is in person and we will add hybrid if we're able to um, based on volunteer support. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we will be returning to our Ward 1 meetings. We had didn't have one in January, but our Ward 1 uh, Meeting will be on Saturday, uh, February 4th. 
And uh, I, I did want to mention, though, that I've been on council a little over seven years. Every time it snows, I hear more from my community members than at any other time. More than crime, fire, pestilence, you let it snow and people are going to call. I don't want to be dismissive of their concerns because it is difficult to get around. And if you're, if you use a walker or uh, you, you have mobility problems, um, it, it's really difficult. And folks can't get out to go to the uh, to the uh, to get their medicine at the pharmacy. Uh, to freshen their grocery supplies, it's difficult, but it's it's old hat. So, thank you. Council Chair, is no report. Okay. <laughs> All right. All right. So a couple a couple quick things since we were ending on snow. I'll pick up on snow. And what I I will say, and Councilor Abel, you are you are right. That's this is tend to when we, we hear a lot, and I live on a cul-de-sac, dead end, that I think when my neighbors thought I became mayor, their street would finally be plowed. And we do not receive a plow, I will tell you, unless these certain circumstances happen. But an observation that I made, and the reason why I knew that we had a plow come down was because I saw it on the cameras, so many folks had driven on the street that they'd packed it down by the time the plow was able to come, it couldn't do anything. And so that might have been some of the other things that happened in some of our dead-end cul-de-sacs. But what I would like to do is give a, a shout-out to Mr. Kirschbaum and Ms. Hodson. And his team, when you look at the service responses that they have put out, have been so thoughtful and willing to jump out there and help. In fact, there was a, a comment on Lakewood Speaks this evening about a concern that came in on Saturday, and there was a plow out at that location this morning. And so I know they're really trying to get out there and help people as much as they can. And whoever responds to these, I just want to give a shout out because they're so thoughtful in the willingness to say, hey, we're, you know, we're trying to learn more and we'll try to be out there to do what we can to help. So please share our gratitude there. I had the opportunity to go to Brady Exploration School and they received a Governor's Bright Spot Award. And if you know the population at Brady, it's it's a it's quite a it's, it's a tough group. It's it's kids that are dealing with real adult issues. They're dealing with homelessness, uh, food insecurity, and that faculty has raised achievement over the last three years uh, through the pandemic and on. And so they received a Governor's Bright Spot Award, which was a fifty thousand uh, dollar grant that they also got. So it was cool to go and celebrate that. And the governor actually did a videotaped um, shout out to him. So. Keep it up to the faculty and those kids and how thankful we are uh, for all that they do. Um, I was in awe of how our community stepped up through the Sub-Zero, and I do want to give a shout out to Pastor Ben and to Sophia, who essentially put together an emergency shelter for three days with very little help. Uh, Ms. Hodson, you gave all the resources that we were able to and we learned a huge lesson about our blind spots, and I think the county has been made aware um, as our human service provider that they need to step up. But when I showed up, and I showed up at the very end to see Councilor May Aguerrero and Pastor Ben um, and a couple volunteers servicing our severe and chronic homeless at 5 a.m., and, and I'll just be honest with you folks that are dealing with schizophrenia, uh, schizophrenia um, severe mental illness, drug addiction, people coming off of drugs. Uh, I don't think Councillor Magro will ever forget some of the things that she dealt with, but I was just overwhelmed with the fact that these folks stepped up and we did not lose a life. Um, we had folks, I think, that may have lost a limb due to frostbite or potentially, but this was severe and it really shows a lack that we have and an opportunity for us. And I know Ms. Hodson is, um, I think people are looking to our cities to say, hey, what could we have done different? And so hopefully next time we won't have this. Uh, we're going to continue to see cold weather, but I think this can help usher in an opportunity for us to do more immediate sheltering and learn. So shout out to 
uh, Pastor Ben and, and Lakewood United Methodist, they had to turn that church over for Christmas Eve services, and it was incredible to see. And then also St. Bernadette, who did the day warming center and, and allowed those folks to come in. And we couldn't have been, uh, wouldn't have been able to do it without you. So thank you very much. And to all the volunteers and all the folks that stepped up, Councilor Sher, as I certainly came by. And again, I was only there at the very end, but it was, it was enough for me to know where we have a huge gap. State Ledge is back in session today. So certainly buckle up. Our legislative committee will probably be busy, but I think a couple things that are gonna be of interest to our community is um, the rumors of the, the governor uh, putting forth some bills that might preempt local control as it relates to housing and affordable housing. So I think that should certainly be on our radar and um, hopefully we'll be engaged and continue to work with our legislators. And one interesting thing that I think we'll all learn a lot about is the usage of hallucinogenic mushrooms went into uh, legal usage, went into effect on January 1st, which is a much different system than our regulated cannabis system. And so I think we're gonna hear more about how that works, what types of places are allowed to utilize those, and actually a limitation on local governments to regulate um, those opportunities. So I, we're gonna learn a lot going forward there. And it's 10.07, so I'll probably cut it off, but I do, I am anxious for this year, 2023, it's gonna be a good year. And as evidenced by a Denver Bronco win yesterday, <laughs> it's a, uh, premonition of what's to come. So happy new year to everybody and thank you all. We will adjourn. <laughs>